Are low omega threes worse than smoking cigarettes? <laughs> um, I don't know that they're worse. So, omega three fatty acids are you know they're essential for many things, and um, I think you're referring to one specific study that came out of uh, Dr. Bill Harris's group. He's the head of the Fatty Acid Research Institute, and he's actually the pioneer of the omega three index test which is how you should measure your omega-3 levels. Um, they're measured in our red blood cells rather than what you'll 99% of the time find if you get an omega-3 test, it's plasma levels. So red blood cells take about 120 days to turn over, so it's a long-term marker of your omega-3. Whereas if you go and get an omega-3 plasma test, it's kind of like, well, what did I eat for dinner in the last week, right? So you, you may have had a bunch of salmon, but maybe you don't usually eat salmon. So so anyways, the omega-3 index is a way to measure omega-3 levels. And he had done a study looking at omega-3 levels and what's called all-cause mortality. So people dying from all sorts of non-accidental causes. Cardiovascular disease, disease is always at the top of the list because that's pretty much what everyone's dying of. That's like the number one cause of uh, death in most developed countries. And so um, he was looking at all-cause mortality and correlating that with the omega-3 index, which essentially is measuring omega-3 fatty acid levels. And um, what he found was that, so people that have a low omega-3 index, so that would be 4% or less, ha and then comparing it to people that had a high omega-3 index, so that would be 8% or higher. So people that had the high omega-3 index had a five-year increased life expectancy compared to people with the low. Now, people in the United States on average have about a 4 to 5 percent omega-3 index. So it's pretty, pretty, standard, pretty standard, I would say, in terms of like what people in the U.S. have in terms of their, of their omega-3 versus Japan, where they eat a lot of seafood. Their omega-3 index is like 10 percent. So, and they have a five-year increased life expectancy, by the way, compared to people in the United States. Um, so what he also did, uh, him and his, his colleagues, looked at, they stratified the, the data and looked at other, other factors, physical activity, you know, BMI, smoking. And this is where it got super interesting because, um, and I, I, I just, the graph of this data does it like more justice, you know, because you can visually see it. But he looked at all-cause mortality, and people that like lived the longest were, of course, the high omega-3 index with no smoking, right? So like non-smokers. They had the longest life expectancy. And then people with the lowest life expectancy were smokers with a low omega-3 index. But then when he looked at people that smoked but had a high omega-3 index, either they're eating a lot of fish or supplementing, they had the same life expectancy as people with low omega-3 but didn't smoke. So in other words... Having a low omega-3 index was like smoking with respect to all-cause mortality. And that's, you know, and of course I get all the smokers out there going, oh, so all I have to do is supplement with omega-3. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's the wrong way to think about it. You know, I think I think most people now know smoking is terrible for your health. And it and it goes back to this idea, this framework that I like to think about nutrition, which is what do we need, right? Instead of like, always focusing on what to avoid. Because if you focus on what to avoid, you still may not be getting what you need to run your metabolism, to run, you know, neurotransmitter synthesis and all of that. So omega-3 fatty acids are hugely important for many things. And we could talk hours for that. But with respect to smoking, it's really quite, you know, it's it, it's kind of astounding when you just look at that graph and they're like overlaid where you're like, oh, wow, non-smokers are with low omega-3 are living as long as smokers with high omega-3. Do you think that this is a direct cause of the omega-3s or is there some healthy user bias that's upstream from the kinds of people who are the kinds of people that are like people that will have omega-3s in their diet? Great question. So um, with this type of data, which is observational data, it's always a correlation. So you can never you know, definitively say it's cause, right? A causation. So yes, there could be, it could be a healthy user bias. There were other factors that were accounted for, but I will say this. Smoking, everyone thinks about smoking and lung cancer or like cancer risk, right? The, actually, the biggest problem with smoking is heart disease. It is a huge, it's so when you, so here's the thing that I like to think about, like with respect to smoking and disease risk. Smoking in a dose dependent manner will increase your risk for lung cancer. So, in other words, the more cigarettes that you smoke, the higher the risk of cancer. But it's not a linear increase with respect to cardiovascular disease and heart attack risk. 
So you can just have a little bit of cigarettes and your, your heart disease risk skyrockets. And omega-3 is one of the biggest things that it protects against is heart disease, right? Doctors prescribe it. So there's been randomized controlled trials where people are given high dose omega-3, purified omega-3 um, in the form of either EPA, which is one of the marine sources or a combination of DHA and EPA. Um, and, and, and a variety of studies have shown that like heart attack risk, um, risk of, of dying from cardi cardiovascular disease is dramatically lower in people that are given omega-3s compared to a placebo. So, you know, the fact that the the non-smokers with um, a low omega-3 index are probably affected. It's affecting their cardiovascular health. Mm. Inflammation is a big, also a big driver of cardiovascular disease. And omega-3s are really good at lowering inflammation in many different ways. So yeah, to, to sort of the long-winded you know, answer to your question is, no, you can't definitively say that healthy user bias isn't involved. But there's a but mechanism that we could see how it would work. There is. And, you know, again, there is adjustment for other health factors. So you would think that that would show up. Let's say that someone goes, I hadn't even thought about omega-3s. I should probably optimize those. What's the 80-20 of getting good omega-3s in your diet? Someone might struggle with seafood. It's kind of hard or expensive to cook at home. Where would you send them for getting it from diet, getting it from supplementation? What do they need to know? So I think um, I talked about the omega-3 index. And again, you want to get 8% or higher. It's always good to measure things. But there's been studies done where people with a low omega-3 index, so the standard American, basically 4%, if you give them about 2 grams a day of omega-3, they can raise their omega-3 index from 4% to 8%. So that would be a supplemental form. Pretty 2 grams. So I'll just give you to give you some perspective, you know, physicians prescribe um, what's Leveza, which is a DHA and EPA ethyl ester form. We can talk about different forms of omega-3 um, of omega-3. And they also prescribe uh, Visipa, which is a highly pure EPA form. And they prescribe them at gram, um, in the gram dose of four grams per day. So that's twice as much as two grams a day, which so I'm, what, what I'm getting at, it's a fairly safe dose. And um, so two grams a day can raise people from 4% to 8%. I think that's a really good sort of just starting point or the average person. Now, I take experimentally higher doses, but, but you know, I think generally speaking, it's pretty safe for most people to take two grams a day and you're going to get that high omega-3 index at 8%. Where are they going to go? How are they going to assess without getting some Norwegian farmer that's squeezing fish into a barrel <laughs> and, and doing it holistically himself? What can you say about assessing the quality of I, I even remember cod liver oil tablets back in the day. There's all sorts of uproar before there was even a podcasting universe to kind of scrutinize it. What do people need to know if they're choosing their omega-3 supplement? I think choosing omega-3 supplement is, um, we actually have a lot of data nowadays. And we have access to that data quite easily because there's a lot of third-party testing sites that go out and they just randomly get fish oil supplements off the grocery store shelves. And they say, I'm going to take this supplement and I'm going to measure important things. I'm going to measure the concentration of the omega-3s, EPA and DHA. Is the concentration in there what is stated on the bottle? I'm going to measure, you know, so fish, it's being isolated. For, it's, it's, a, it's an oil. It's in the fat, right? So um, fish also have contaminants. They have PCBs. They have mercury, among others. And so measuring those contaminants is important because fish oil is generally purified, but you want to make sure a good job was done. So those contaminants are measured. And then um, oxidation. So omega-3s are a polyunsaturated fatty acid prone to oxidation. And so you don't want to get something that has an oxidation of greater than 10. So anything greater than 10 of total oxidation, you want to avoid because it's like consuming rancid fat, right? Rancid lipids. Like you don't want to do that. So so you those things are all measured and um, there's sources out there. So Consumer Lab is a, you know, third-party testing site that, you know, they just, I, there's a lot of affordable brands that you can find because some supplements are just very expensive. So I do like to kind of send people there because I have no affiliation with Consumer Lab, by the way. I just like that. I, I like I use them. So I like that you can go and find a, a pretty decent quality fish oil supplement. If you're a data nerd like me, you can take this up a level and you can go to the International Fish Oil Standards site, IFOS. They just, I mean, it's like data party. Like they give you so much data, but like you have to like know what to do with it. So they measure all these things, but like at everything else, right? Um, and they also tell you the form it's in. So I mentioned ethyl ester for the prescription form. There's also triglyceride form. Those are the two main forms that you can find fish oil supplements or omega-3 supplements in. And um, 
generally speaking, triglyceride form is is the most bioavailable. Triglyceride form is what is the form that if you're eating fish, the, the, the omega-3s are in triglyceride form. When the omega-3s are purified, they take it out of the triglyceride form and they purify it and it's in an ethyl ester form. Some companies then re-esterify it back into that form to make it supreme and more bioavailable. Both pure and bioavailable. Exactly. But not everyone does that. And so if you get an ethyl ester form, which is what is prescribed, most people that are getting prescription form of omega-3 to help prevent cardiovascular disease, they're taking ethyl ester form. That's what I've got. The thing to know is you have to take it with a meal and preferably with a higher fat meal because it is absor- it, it, you will absorb so little if you're taking it on an empty stomach. It's very important. And um, I didn't want to get into all the nuance, but I mentioned two grams a day of omega-3 will raise your omega-3 index from low to high, right? 4% to 8%. Well, if you really kind of look at the form people were taking, triglyceride versus ethyl ester, you know, they had to take, you know, less of the triglyceride form to get there. But so I like to just average it out and say two. But um, so if you can get triglyceride form, it's it's a great form to get. How much salmon or cod or halibut do I need to eat per week if I was going to try and get this through my diet? Right. I mean, that's that's a question that I don't have empirical data to back up. But I'll, so so here's my sort of thoughts on that. Um, I do think that wild Alaskan salmon is one of the best sorts of omega three because. Um, that is a fish that has a very low level of contaminants like mercury, um, PCBs per gram or per ounce, I guess is usually measured per ounce of the, of the fish, right? So salmon would be a great source. Now, how much of that do you have to eat? Uh, it's really, you know, depends on the cooking method, like how how cooked was it? Because you can degrade some of the omega-3s. They are somewhat heat sensitive. So I don't know how much you you would have to do a test. Right. So you'd have to say, okay, I typically eat salmon two nights a week or three nights a week. And and then you want to wait 120 days, right? <laughs> because it takes that long for your red blood cells to turn over. Okay. I know. Here's the protocol. Rhonda, just just tell me how much salmon I need to eat. Come on. Please. Um, well, I, I don't know. I twice a week? Yeah, at least. At twice. least. Okay. I would I would say you probably have to supplement on top of that. I don't know that twice a week is nefli- necessarily going to go from 4% to 8%. Got you. But if you were to do, you know, I, I would imagine a lot of the people that care about this listening to this protocol will think, right, I'm going to find a good quality, uh, low oxidation triglyceride version of omega-3s that are responsibly sourced that I like the look of. I'm going to take two grams of that per day, and I'm probably going to try and have some sort of fish meal twice per week. Does that seem realistic? That's absolutely. That's kind. Of, that's what I do. I mean, I did it. I'm, that's what I... I do. I do up the dose a little bit more, but like I said, you know, I like eat it. Like I take it throughout the day. The omega threes. You mentioned about smoking there. Did you see that the UK is thinking about introducing? It looks like it's going to introduce a disposable vape ban countrywide. That literally came up. Disposable vape ban. Yeah. Is there non disposable vapes that? Yeah. So you know the kind of uh, liquid that people, the e liquid that people put into the these huge things that look like knuckle dusters. Yeah. So those will still be allowed. Okay. So people can still get the non-disposable vape liquid plus the contraptions you need to make it work. But the Elf Bar, the Esco Bar, that stuff. What are teenagers getting their hands on? What are junior high Are they getting it's mon- the, the disposable? It's the disposables, yeah. Is that, is that yeah. the well, driving force? It's just force? way more, it's way more um, arduous to be, you go and buy this thing and then you get the liquid and then you fill it with the liquid and all the rest of it. And the flavors are a little bit more tough to balance. Uh, but yeah, it's the disposable stuff. There's a couple of comments about oh, an environmental impact because they do, you know, the, the batteries, so you're basically throwing away a battery with some residual nicotine in it. Um, not good, but more not good is the fact that teachers in the UK have found that like a non insignificant percentage of school children are dependent on disposable vapes. Okay, so I was going to say I don't. There's like I could see arguments either way. I'm personally, as a parent, and I have talked to teachers. I mean, it's insane, huge problem in in you know many schools where in the U.S. Yes, in the U.S. Where vaping. Vaping in class, <laughs> in the bathrooms. Yeah, they've installed and, and these are like special 12, 13 year old vape detectors in the bathrooms of uh, British schools. Yeah, no, it's a problem here too, especially in public schools. And uh, so I, I personally like am biased and I, I'm like, good. Like, I don't want these, like, it's, ter- it's so easy and it's like bubblegum flavored. It's like, yep. it's like geared towards, tr- I almost feel like, is, was there a push to like get them earlier? But, you know, uh, so in that regard, I'm, 
I'm on I'm on board to be honest. Have you looked into the dangers of vaping much at all? What do you think about that? I ha- I you know I've tweeted a couple of studies. I haven't done a deep dive on it. I mean like I know there's some you know studies about like lung issues, but like I don't know if it was like contaminants that are hitchhiking in with the vape. You know so. No, I haven't done a deep yeah. dive, but I do plan on doing a deeper dive into like that world of like nicotine and and vaping. And now's the time with this UK ban. So yeah, it's um, I've been thinking about it for a while. Has the introduction of fruity flavored vapes, like sparkle rainbow unicorn dust flavored vapes and and stuff, which are easily accessible, pretty cheap, four thousand puffs or two thousand puffs or whatever, so like, they last for quite a while. Has that been a net positive or negative? Because it's certainly allowed a lot of people who were previously smokers and cigarettes are, no matter how bad you think the vapes are, cigarettes are so much worse, like 20 times worse based on the stuff that I've seen uh, as an uneducated reader of non-scientific journals. Uh, but how many more people have been thin end of the wedged into a nicotine dependency because it's more convenient, because the smoking bans, you can now do it inside, tastes better, like it's just a more enjoyable experience. The hit is very, very high and 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 fast. Uh, so I wonder whether the introduction of the vape world has been a net positive or negative against cigarettes. Because to me, cigarettes seem. Mark Norman's got this great joke where he says that uh, smoking an actual cigarette now is so socially uh, like pushed back against that if someone saw you in an alleyway and you were secretly trying to smoke a cigarette and they asked what you were doing, you'd say that you were killing a hooker because like that's more socially acceptable. Wait, is it still like that? And so I haven't been like the last time I went to, I was in like Amsterdam 2015. I was shocked by how many people were just smoking. Mainland like, Europe's different. They're a different breed. Italians, the Spanish, the French, you know, they're eating croissants at 10 p.m. at night, just chain smoking with a glass of red wine. They're going to live to 105. It doesn't matter, right? They're different. They're built different over there. I don't know what's going but, on. But them. you know what? This just kind of brings back to the your, your first point was uh, the smoking and the omega-3. And don't Japanese men smoke pretty? I'm pretty sure. And they, they're living nick- on average longer and they eat a lot of fish, right? Smokers, high omega-3 index. It Smoke goes as much as possible, <laughs> eat enough fish. But so here's another thing. Um, Max Lugavere, you know Max? No, I don't. Great guy. You should. He's very much in your world, a genius foods guy, real cool dude. He introduced me to these things called knickknacks. So they are like very um, carefully sourced, like nicotine uh, mints, I guess. And um, just nicotine as a nootropic yeah. nicotine is a, an improver for focus uh, attention seems to be like that's big at the moment but then the pouches zins and mm-hmm. snus and stuff like that there's a lot of questions about what's that doing to your gums what's actually in that there's flavorings in them now where the flavorings coming from so it's like there's this permanent sort of cycle of something new comes in and oh that might be really great and then it comes out the bottom end and you're like oh we, we don't know what's in it and it might actually be really dangerous for everyone so someone someone that's in their 30s and in that world that like I'm not in um is the is is who mentioned to me like have you looked into nicotine cuz I like I use these zen is it zen yeah, yeah and and I'm just like what is this like this is like it's an entire new and, universe and of like, stimulants I have got to look into all this because like eventually my son will be you know of the age and so that's that's kind of what started my 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 um interest in doing a deep dive on nicotine is like Okay, well, is there a negative effect? Like maybe there's a trade-off. There's always a trade-off. There's always a trade-off. Mm. So what is it? What is it? Right? Very interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm fascinated by what's gonna what's downstream from new technologies, whether it be uh legitimate technology like typical sort of screens, social media, virtual reality, Apple's new headset just came out recently, or it's health technologies or it's deliver, d- delivery mechanisms for things that we used to have. But this is in a new way. And what does that actually mean? So yeah. We'll get back to talking to Rhonda in one minute, but first I need to tell you about Ketone IQ. 60% of Tour de France riders use Ketone IQ to help them with their energy and mental clarity. And that's why I use it as my pre-workout. I don't want to have caffeine upon waking, but I still want to have energy to make sure that I have a good session, which is why I use this. It gives me really clean energy. There's no jitters. There's no crash afterward. And it massively helps 
with mental clarity. Ketones are the brain and body's preferred fuel source, but getting into a state of ketosis is hard. You often have to fast for a long time or restrict carb intake or exercise your glycogen stores away, but that can take days. Ketone IQ delivers ketones to your bloodstream within minutes. It has no sugar, no caffeine, and hundreds of five-star reviews. Best of all, they've got a 60-day money-back guarantee, so you can buy it and try it for 59 days. And if you do not like it, they'll give you your money Back. Right now, you can get a 30% discount off your first subscription order by going to the link in the description below or heading to hvmn.com slash modernwisdom. That's hvmn.com slash modernwisdom. Talk to me about time-restricted feeding because for a long time, that was like the hot new girl in school and everyone loved it and it was really interesting. But it seems like the trend is swaying at least a little bit away from time-restricted feeding, especially on a morning. So what's your, how do you conceptualize all of this now? Um, so time-restricted feeding or time-restricted eating, you know, it, the, it it's a form of intermittent fasting, right? And I think that many people, when they think about intermittent fasting, they think, okay, well, I just need to skip a meal. I need to like have a period of, I need to extend my period of time where I'm not eating. And the easiest way to do that is skip, skip a meal. Um, and that's kind of what happened. So, you know, S Dr. Sachin Panda, a good friend of mine, big, you know, circadian biologist researcher, does a lot of research on time-restricted feeding. And, um, you know, we talked about this like almost 10 years ago. E essentially, there's a circadian reason to eat your food within a certain time window. And then have a period of rest and fasting, right? So everything on our body runs on a clock and including our metabolism. And, um, you know, so, so we're most insulin sensitive in the morning, least sensitive, uh, uh, insulin sensitive in the evening, right? So, you know, your blood glucose levels will go much higher with the same carbohydrate intake in the evening versus the morning. Even, you know, just calories are the same. Everything's the same. There's also some argument to be made by you just need a period of rest, like, your gut, digestion, all that, like energy is being diverted to do that when you're digesting food. Like that's that's a big thing. And there's also a lot of responses that happen after you eat a meal, causing inflammation and things like that that divert energy there. So it's taking energy away from other things like repair. So, so repairing processes usually happen when you're in a fasted state. So just like when you're sleeping, your brain shuts down, right? Like your brain, if you didn't sleep, your brain's not going to repair. It's not going to stop. Like you need that rest period. Well, the same goes for like other organs. Like it need they need a rest period. And and so it's really important to have that rest period, right? So the longer the rest it, the longer the rest period is, the better in terms of like having enough energy to like do those repair processes. Things like that require energy and there's also, you know, other reasons as well. But generally speaking, um there's an argument why it's good to have a rest period, a fasting period, right? And is that, does it need to be 16 hours? Does it need to be 20? Does it need to be 12? Like, I don't, I don't really know that we know the exact time um, to that. But what we do know is that talking about this to the public was translated to, I need to skip breakfast. That was like, the take home was, okay, I need to do a 16 hour, I need to do eat my food within eight hours and do a 16 hour fast. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to skip breakfast and yeah. keep extend my fast. Lunch period. at 12, have dinner right. at eight, graze between then and, and that was it's hands off. Exactly. And that was that was kind of the, the take home, the practical implication there that everyone started doing. Um, the problem with that is that, you know, so our muscle is the biggest reservoir for amino acids, just like you know, we store glucose as glycogen in our liver and our muscle. We store um, triglyceride as, you know, you know, we fat as triglycerides in our adipose tissue. We don't really store muscle. I mean, we don't really store amino acids, but you can kind of think of the muscle as a reservoir for it. Because when we have a period of um, basically we're not getting an intake of amino acids, we need it. We need amino acids to survive. Like we need them. And so our body pulls from our muscle. So in the morning, if you think about it, what's the longest period you go without having amino acids? Well, it's when you're sleeping. So breakfast is actually really important. It's, in, it's important to get protein, amino acids in that first meal, because if you extend that, me if you extend that fasting period by skipping breakfast, your body is going to be like, I need protein. I need, I got to make a bunch of proteins to like have my heart beat and my kidneys function, right? So it's going to pull amino acids out of your muscle. And so um, that can cause muscle atrophy. 
particularly if you're not doing resistance training. So amino acid is one way to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Um, the other way to do it would be resistance training. So there have been studies done, like, for example, women that are doing time-restricted feeding. They will not lose muscle mass if they're doing resistance training. Mm. So, Does it mitigate the gains of resistance training by doing that? It mitigates the, the atrophy. So it, it's mitigating... No, the sorry. Does time-restricted feeding, i.e. skipping breakfast, limit the gains made from resistance training if... Both of those things are done together. N not, not if you're getting enough protein. I mean, it, it, not in that study, at least. Understood. I think, I think if you're not getting enough protein within 24 hour period, yes. But like, if you're getting, so, so the, to get your gains in, and I'm sure you've had people on talking about this, but like the RDA for protein is 0 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight, and that was like determined like forever ago when we were using older techniques we as in scientists not me because i haven't personally done this experiment but um the scientific community was using techniques that uh underestimated amino acid losses so so these committees were set up to determine okay how many how much amino acids do, you know how, what quantity of amino acids do we lose every day and how much do we make sure we have to get each day to replenish that right um and so those losses were underestimated in other words we're losing more than they thought. And so what what does that mean? That means, oh, maybe we're, the RDA for protein is too low. So people like Dr. Stuart Phillips and others have now redone these experiments with like newer, more sensitive technologies, because that's what happens with time, right? We get better technologies, more sensitivity. And they've now determined that it's actually 1.2 grams per kilogram to just bare minimum prevent losses. It's and another 50% on top of what was originally. 50% on what originally. And if you're actually doing, if you're physically active, if you're doing resistance training, that goes up to 1.6 wow. grams per kilogram body minimum. weight. And well, 1.2 was the minimum, but like yep. to like build muscle yep. to get the gains you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And there's actually been studies done in older adults. This is a big problem. Older adults are, they're not as sensitive to amino acids. It's called anabolic resistance. So with the same protein intake, they won't build as much muscle if they're 65 versus when they were 35. So granddad needs to be cooking twice as many steaks. He needs basically. twice as many steaks. And there have been studies looking at the actual RDA. If older adults get 0 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight, and then the other group gets 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight, the group that got 1.2 has much higher muscle mass gains. Yep. And and just pre actually prevents the atrophy that is, ha is happening just with age. Okay. So getting back to the time-restricted yes. eating thing. Yes. <clears throat> How should someone incorporate this into their lifestyle? What it sounds like you're saying is have a high protein meal at some point early in the day. Uh, but if you're also saying that it's important for us to have a period of rest and digest so that it's digest, rest and repair can actually happen. How should people think about, about doing that? Especially given the fact that, sorry, later in the day, insulin sensitivity is... Uh, skewed anyone that did carb night or carb backloading 15 years ago because they read a bodybuilding.com forum like me knows that. So you've kind of got this, oh, it's good to eat some things later in the day. There's this skew down that way, but there's also we can't miss breakfast. So it's like, that just sounds like eating all day to me. When do we, when do we stop? Right. Um, yeah. Sorry. I went off on a tangent there, but yeah. So, um, the 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 time restricted eating okay there's a there's a couple good ways to think about about it you want to stop eating about three hours before you go to bed if possible okay that's last bit of food in mouth yes yes because it's still you got to add another five so last bit of, bit of food in mouth doesn't mean I'm now in a fasted state you got to calculate five hours after that it takes about five hours to digest okay so after the five hours after your last bit of food in the mouth now you're in a fasted state right so that's going to be when you're sleeping, most likely. Um, you don't have to skip a meal. You can eat your food within an eight-hour period and fast for 16 hours without having to skip a meal most of the time. Unless, I guess, unless you're an entertainer and your meals do come later, then, but still, you can still, like, everything's just shifted over. And yes, you'll be, you know, less insulin, insulin sensitive later in the day, but you can like do some air squats for two minutes. Like you could, there are, there, there are things you can do to improve insulin sensitivity and also to improve glucose 
blood glucose levels like later in the evening if you're having a meal. And we can talk more about that later. But anyway, so there are things you can do. I think that the way to think about it is the easy way is to, to stop eating about three hours before bed. That's a really easy. And also your sleep improves because you're when you're digesting, if you eat like right before you go to bed, your body's like awake. It's like awake, right? It's like digesting and using energy. It's it's well, not even beyond what's happening physiologically. Just the sense of being full. So I was a club promoter for fifteen years, which meant that we would work from uh, we'd set the club up at nine p.m. and we'd finish at two in the morning, and I'd get back, and the food that I'd prepped that morning, the day before's morning, would be there waiting for me. Oh well, you know, I haven't eaten in six hours, seven hours, something like that. Okay, so I'll get in and I'll eat, but just the discomfort of having a lot of food in you like even that sucks right. right uh and you know the other thing is with with uh thinking about it i think um a lot of you know, people got all like you know in a tizzy over over the fact that like if you looked at the the time restricted feeding and the weight loss a lot of the weight loss was due to caloric restriction because people were just actually eating less they were skipping meals yeah. and it's like yeah so a lot of weight loss i mean when it comes to weight loss like calories in calories out matter like energy balance, right? So that's important. I think that's where a lot of people were like, oh, time restricted eating doesn't matter because it's all about caloric restriction. And it's like, well, yeah, if you're looking at what endpoint are you looking at? Are you trying to lose weight? Then you, caloric restriction, like you should be not eating Get as that much. however you want. Right. And most people that are like obese, even overweight, they can actually they can actually fast and not lose as much muscle. Like some people will go on a fast or do, you know, limit their, the, they'll skip meals basically. And they can lose like up to 30% of their weight will come from muscle. So, That's you know, crazy. it's crazy unless you do resistance training. A resistance training is Which important. will mitigate that. Which will but mitigate presumably, that. presumably only if you're having sufficient protein outside of that intermittent fasting window? Not necessarily. Um, that will help you gain more, but like mitigating the atrophy because- You've got the stimulus. you got the stimulus. Okay. What would you suggest as a good selection of breakfasts that people could have that kind of meet the criteria that you're talking about here? What I would mean, be some eggs, of the things? Right, eggs would be like like four, depending on your body weight. You know, some if you're if you're a dude, you're probably gonna have more like five eggs. Scrambled eggs are great. You've got, I mean, it's got the protein, and eggs are really high, and they have like lutein and choline in them. I mean, choline's important for brain function. Um, lutein. It's much higher in greens like kale, but there's some in at least pasture-raised eggs from the the farm, you know, the non-conventional eggs or whatever they're called. Those are terrible. Um, but what is that? To, just to interject that, what is that to know about eggs? How do you select your eggs? Pasture-raised um, because you want them to eat like grass and stuff. The chickens because they're get they're getting like lutein from the greens, and lutein is really important for brain function and eye function. I would love to talk about that more when we talk about cognitive function because it actually there's like a lot there's not enough lutein in an egg to substitute what's done in the clinical studies, but there is in kale. So, uh, but still, it's good to get a source of it. So I think I think eggs is a really good source of um, protein for breakfast mm -hmm. because it's you know it's just it's very nutrient dense with the choline as well. Choline's really high in egg yolk. Bacon and eggs, steak and eggs. Yeah, I mean like whatever your your jam is like for the for the protein, bacon and eggs, steak and eggs. You know. Um, I like to also have some smoked salmon and eggs. So like my omega threes. Mm. What about the people who are training first thing in the morning? Let's say that they've got to get to work. They're part of the, you know, they're the six a.m. CrossFit crowd. They're not going to be up at four thirty doing their scrambled eggs so that they can digest it in time to go do Fran. They're going to probably do a protein shake, like whey protein. So you would still, even for the people that are up early and then go to go and train, it's such a high priority that you would still suggest consuming some protein it's, prior to working out. It's hard to get 1.6. And then you, and then like, you know, so Stuart Phillips likes to use this analogy. I'll give him credit for it. Like where you're squeezing the last drops out of the cloth. Like for people that are like really trying to gain muscle mass, like it's like really their thing. You can go like up to like two you're getting like two grams per kilogram body weight. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, there are some people that like, so if you're really trying to like gain that muscle, uh, you do Pretty need much to, one gram per pound. You do, yeah, you do need, unless, you know, unless you're just gonna eat like, you know, a lunch and dinner and lots and lots of protein, but it's really not that, it's hard to get that much protein. We had this uh, like rule at uni, which was no one flukes one gram per pound of body weight. No one accidentally goes through their day and looks back at the macros they've eaten and goes, I hit 180 grams of protein without thinking. Like it has to be conscious. Yeah, There's yeah. no 
casual diet, unless you went to an all-you-can-eat buffet. And even if you do that, it seems like the upper bound for protein absorption within one meal is kind of like 50 grams in any case. Or less, yeah. So 30 to 40, 40, yeah. Yeah. So you're like, okay, well, well done. You managed to get through four steaks there, but how much of that is actually going to be used by your body? So um, yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I found it fascinating kind of observing this intermittent fasting to we still need to do this but we need to integrate it but we need to front load the protein earlier in the day uh, and also to just alleviate the protein debt that your 1.6 per kilo of body weight needs to hit by the end of the day yeah i think that it's it's it's, it makes sense when you just think about it like if you're if you're skipping a meal you're going to be losing muscle mass like especially if you're not doing any resistance training and that's like okay well then i probably shouldn't be skipping a meal but i i can still do time restricted eating you know, by just stopping my meals before three hours before bed. And then, you know, you're going to get a period of fasting. Really, you just want that repair mode. You know, you want that repair mode. And and there's been clinical studies that have looked at other endpoints besides weight loss, and it does make a difference. That it, like there's improvements in things like blood pressure, for example, things like that. But I don't know that you're going to get the repair. Like there's animal studies mechanistically looking at that. You're not, I don't know that we're going to get that in human data on that. It's going to be hard to do. Um, not impossible, but it's it's definitely going to cost money to get a clinical trial doing that sort of work. Talk to me about the rest of your framework for approaching nutrition and making decisions about food. Um, I Like I said, I really like to make decisions about you know, so I did my postdoctoral research with Dr. Bruce Ames, and um, he's he's sort of a legend, and uh, he's 96 now. And uh, but you know, we he he specialized for uh, some towards the end, mid to end of his career on micronutrients, right? These are important minerals and vitamins and amino acids and fatty acids that you need to get from your diet to run your metabolism. And when I say your metabolism, I don't just mean fat burning. I mean DNA repair. I mean you know, making energy, I mean, making dopamine and serotonin and everything, right? So um, a lot of minerals are cofactors for the enzymes that are doing that. In other words, if you don't get those minerals, then the enzymes aren't going to be working optimally. And so, you know, things aren't going to be working optimally. And if you're talking about things like repair, what happens is you get this insidious damage. So magnesium is a perfect example. Half the country doesn't get enough magnesium, which is about 320 milligrams for women and 420 for men. And so what happens when you're not getting enough magnesium? Well, nothing as far as you know. You look in the mirror and you're fine, right? You're not like, oh, damage is happening. You know, you can't see it on a daily basis. If you could, it would be so much more apparent to us, but um, it's insidious. It's just, it's occurring a little bit each day. And as decades build up, you're not going to be repairing damage to your DNA. And DNA damage is a major, major cause of oncogenic mutations. These are mutations that lead to cancer. So then you get into your fifth, sixth, seventh decade of life and you got pancreatic cancer, or you got fill in the blank cancer. Um, and there are, of course, studies associating magnesium intake with cancer and, you know, studies looking at DNA repair as well. So, the way I like to think about nutrition is what do I need to get for my diet that is essential for, for me to be functioning optimally, for me to prevent the damage that can lead to neurodegenerative disease, to cancer. Um, that's that's a kind of the way. And then also, what do I need to get in terms of like my macronutrients? Like protein is a really important one. I need, I need to think about like how much protein to get, right? Because atrophy happens. You start to, you know, you peak muscle mass 35 20 to 30s i guess and then as you get into your 40s you start to lose a lot more like 8% per decade and then you get into your 70s that it goes up to 12%. So sad. Yeah. So that's how i like to think about it where it's like okay i need to get magnesium i need to get omega 3 i need to get vitamin k i need to get so what foods are rich in those and a lot of minerals and um, some vitamins that it, it it's it's spread out amongst different food groups so Vegetables, particularly leafy greens, are really high in, you know, magnesium. They're high in calcium. They're high in vitamin K. They're high in folate. Like we need folate. This is like amazing uh, to talk about this experiment that my mentor did back in like it was like the eighties. But um, essentially, like he took he took animals and gave them a fol- folate deficient diet in one group, and then the other group he irradiated the mice like ionizing radiation like the stuff that gives you cancer okay and and he looked at double-stranded breaks to your dna and that's like the start of 
DNA damage that can lead to cancer. Right? Ionizing radiation causes double-stranded breaks in your DNA. And he compared the two groups, and they were identical. So not having folate in your diet was like being ionized, getting ionizing radiation. Or you can get yourself ionized as much as you want as long as you eat spinach. I mean, no, because it's going to do the same thing as not eating spinach. But the point is that people know to avoid going in a machine that's going to be ionized, right? But they don't think about, do I need folate? Do you know? So it's like that, again, it's that, what do I need to avoid mentality, yep. which isn't, it's not that you shouldn't think about, like you do need to think about things to avoid, but we need, I think the priority and the focus first is what do I need to get from my diet? That's so interesting. The uh, tend toward demonization of certain food groups and awareness and concern about this is poisoning you, this is bad for you, this is something that you need to avoid. Absolutely. But if you just avoided a ton of stuff, you still haven't got what you actually need. Exactly. And if you focus on what you actually need, guess what you avoid? A ton of stuff. Yeah. And so and I also think it sort of has to do with this, like, it's this learned helplessness mentality where it's like someone else's fault. They're poisoning me. It's like, you know what I mean? Rather than what am I not what, what am I not taking initiative to, like, know that I need to get into my body? Yep. Right. Versus. They're poisoning me. It's the pesticides. It's the this. It's the that. It's the and they are kind of to some degree. But how worried are you about oxalates in leafy greens? Yeah. So oxalates, um, mo mostly high in spinach, not kale. And you know, if you're juicing spinach every day and you have like kidney problems, that's probably a bad idea. So oxalates, um, you know, if you're if you're cooking the spinach, that basically, you know, causes enzymes to degrade, you know, these oxalates. And it's not as much of a problem. Um, but, you know, I think there's been, like, again, a demonization of it. It's like it's like this anti-nutrient. It's like, oh, this is a reason I shouldn't eat leafy greens because yeah. of the oxalates and it's yeah. going to give me kidney stone. And the reality is, is that, you know, oxalates are like you don't need, you you only absorb so much, particularly like if there's magnesium present. And there's so much magnesium in these greens that's mostly not the problem. And the problem with oxalates, again, you'll get like that one case study with the woman with failed kidney syndrome that was juicing every day for like years. And it's like, don't give me that example. Like that, you know. Unless you're a power user of spinach. It's it, it's really spinach. And some people have been I saying kale. I love spinach. It's so good though. Spinach is good. I love spinach too. Um, Spinach salads are not going to like, don't, it's not, it, you're getting good stuff from spinach. It's really high in magnesium. It's really high. In, folate was first isolated from my mentor's mentor, uh, Peter Mitchell, from spinach. That's, he discovered that vitamin. He discovered it from, and he isolated it from spinach. So it's really high in spinach. Okay. So leafy greens. Yeah. Important. Yes. Um, okay. Then you want to get B vitamins. Again, folate is a B vitamin, but getting, getting uh, B vitamins, zinc. Um, also, you want to get iron. These are also important micronutrients, you know, minerals. That's where you get the meat, right? So red meat for the iron and the protein, B vitamins, it's got zinc um, as well. Poultry is another option, right? So these are good sources of um, protein and other micronutrients that you're not going to get as much from plants. What are you thinking about when it comes to sourcing and choosing your meats? Uh, yeah, so there's been some studies that have compared like grass-fed cows versus like meat from grass-fed cows versus like conventionally raised cows. And I would say the biggest difference is, at least from the data that's been published, is, you know, for one, the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid profile. So which makes sense. If you're if you're feeding a cow a bunch of corn, and I think they also have like it's like corn oil, like pellets and, you know, it's like they're going to have a higher omega-6 profile, right? They're going to have more omega-6 because that's corn. Um, versus if you're going to give them like plants, they're going to eat plants, they're going to have a better omega-3 to omega-6 profile. And so, and that's exactly what you'll find. So like, even though meat isn't like the best source of omega-3, if you get, if you're, if you're eating, you know, ground beef or a steak from a cow that was, you know, pasture raised, it's going to have a higher omega-3 profile than, than the conventional meat. And there's, you know, I, there's some, there's some argument to be made for that. It's like, well, and then there's also things like, well, you know, what you have to think about, like what food um, is there? Is it like, are they given food that's, that's doused in glyphosate? Like, I don't know, like what's, you know, how the, the corn crop is like, that's how they're growing lots of corn. Right. So, you know, there's, you can sort of 
obsess over everything. You have to like, I think you have to sort of choose your battles. Otherwise you can just go insane. So, you know, there do do you have to eat pasture-raised meat? I don't know that you do. If you can, it's better. Like not everyone can afford, like food is so expensive now too, right? So at the end of the day, like our bodies can handle a lot of damage. They really can. But like th- that is only if you give them the things they need to repair that damage and be able to like be, you know, more more optimally functional. So um, that's kind of my my take on the, the you know, pasture raised versus conventional. I personally do get pasture raised. I prefer it. Also the hormones. If they're not, I think generally speaking, they go hand in hand. They like, you know, give hormones and antibiotics to cows and stuff. And it's like, oh, do I... Do I want a bunch of antibiotics in my meat that I'm eating, right? Like that's another thing to consider. What do people mean when they talk about prioritizing energy balance? I hear this and yeah. I, don't, I have no idea what they're talking Calor- about. I mean, I think ultimately they're, they're, they're calories in, calories out kind of thing. Like, you know, if you're, if you're consuming like a ton of calories and you're not physically active, like that's, you're going to start storing more fat. Like it's, you know, just simple Maths. Math. <laughs> yep. So that's, I would say, the easiest way to think about it mm-hmm. um, is is really just calories in, calories out really does matter. Like it really does. Like you're going to, you know, so you don't want to just eat eat tons and tons of food. Like you don't want to eat a bag of potato chips like after you do your Peloton. Yeah. And I guess uh, going back to one of the reasons why intermittent fasting was so popular was that it's, you don't really need to be as obsessive with your MyFitnessPal if you only have a six hour eating window because for Lots of people, it's tough to get over surplus during just six hours, as long as you're eating whole foods, mostly blah, 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 blah. Uh, and that's what it comes down to. I think exactly that is that if like the people, the, they're, they're calorically restricting naturally when they're doing intermittent fasting, yeah. right? And so that's why it was, it, it all comes down to calories in, calories out. That's what caloric restriction is. You're restricting, you're not eating as many calories and you end up, you know, losing weight. But if you eat whole foods, and I really do think like the paleo movement back in when, I mean, it was like how, 15, 20 years. I don't even know how long ago it was, yeah. but they were onto something. I think that's a really good way to eat because you're not just only eating meat. You're not just only eating plants. You're getting the broad spectrum of micronutrients. And there's other things in plants that are like phytochemicals that are beneficial as well, right? So it's not just getting the micronutrients. It's also getting these other you know, chemicals that are like doing beneficial things in us that we know for sure from randomized controlled trials are doing beneficial things. So, you know, that's another added reason to kind of have a more diverse whole foods type of diet. We'll get back to talking to Rhonda in one minute, but first I need to tell you about Momentus. You might've heard me say that I took my testosterone from 495 to 1006. And two of the supplements I used throughout that were Fidoji Regrestus and Tonkat Ali. I first heard Andrew Huberman talk about the really impressive effects that these have on testosterone, but the problem is most supplements don't actually contain what they say. Momentus make the only NSF certified Fidoji Agrestis and Tonkat Ali in the world, meaning that even Olympians can use it because that is the level of testing that these products are put through. Also, if you're looking for a great supply of omega-3s that Dr. Rhonda Patrick's just been talking about, they also do that too. Best of all, there is a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you can buy everything completely risk-free, try it for 29 days, and if you do not like it, they will give you your money back, no questions asked. Right now, you can get a 20% discount off everything site-wide, including all of the products I use and recommend by going to the link in the description below or heading to livemomentous.com slash modernwisdom and using the code MODERNWISDOM at checkout. That's live, M-O-M-E-N-T-O-U-S dot com slash modernwisdom. What are the most important things to consider when it comes to improving cognitive function? A lot of people want better focus. They want to be more productive. They want to improve their mood. They want to do all of those things. Like, what are the big movers when we think cognitive function? So there's what I like to think of as there's definitely big movers There's things that require effort and there's like lower hanging fruit, right? So this is things that like you could take a supplement perhaps. And I would say the big movers are the ones that, of course, are going to require more effort. Like that's always how it is, right? And it's pretty clear now. I don't think I think it's pretty scientific consensus that exercise and particularly vigorous exercise is one of the best ways that you can get a cognitive enhancement. 
you know, memory, executive function, processing speed. So there have been studies that have been done in older adults, in middle-aged adults, in children, like across the lifespan. And it's just undeniable that getting your heart rate up, you know, getting getting your heart rate up and blood flow up and sweating is going to make you smarter and feel better. It's going to make you both. So um, like there was there was even one study that was done in older adults. And this was like a classic study that I, I just remember. I've talked about it for years, but other studies have like repeated it since then. But it was like 2011 or 20, 2012 published in PNAS. And um, this this researchers took these older adults and they put them on a year long intervention exercise program. And there was a lot of um, more vigorous intensity. So they're getting up to about 80% max heart rate, 75, 80% max heart rate. And um, for one year, they did this intervention. Um, and after that year, they had an, a 2% increase in their hippocampal volume. So hippocampus is a part of your brain that's highly involved in learning and memory. And they had increased it by like 2%. So people that it, in that age group lose between 1% to 2% of their hippocampal volume per year. So they essentially countered that loss that atrophy that they're they're age related, you know, experiencing each year, and um, and so part of the reason that happens is when you're doing a vigorous type of exercise, you are increasing brain derived neurotrophic factor (BDNF), and that is responsible for growing new neurons in the hippocampus. It's responsible for neuroplasticity, so that's the ability of your brain to like adapt and change to the changing environment, which is what older adults don't do very well, right? Your, your brain's much more plastic when it's younger; like you can adapt to things. That's why you, that's saying you, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, right? I mean, that's kind of where it comes from. So BDNF plays a role in that. So you want more BDNF, like you an exercise and particularly vigorous exercise. If you're working your muscles so hard that they can't get oxygen to them fast enough, and that's why I say vigorous, um, then they're forced to basically make energy without oxygen. And that happens by just using glucose. And then you make lactate as a byproduct. And lactate is what is signaling and increasing that BDNF. And lactate's really, I mean, you can measure it. There's, you know, things out there that you can buy and measure it. But I don't think you need to. I think you can just measure your heart rate. And if you're getting, if you're doing a vigorous intensity exercise, 10 minutes, that's all it took was 10 minutes to have improvements in cognition, uh, executive function, processing speed. So even just a 10 minute workout. And like I did one before I was came here. Like that's like, that's my thing. I do, you know, it's like, I want, I want to be on top of my game. So you just can do a 10 minute you know, workout. It could be high intensity interval training where you're shifting between periods of vigorous exercise and then kind of resting a little bit. And then so you do these intervals or it could just be like, I'm going to do a 20 minute like and run and then I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to do it. So um, exercise. Exercise is the number one, I would say, big mover, as you said. It's also the most requires the most effort. The other things, and this is where I kind of like I'm smiling because there was very recently a new study, um, one out of three very large randomized placebo-controlled trials where they're giving one group a placebo and another group a multivitamin. Okay, this is a multivitamin, which is the micronutrients I've been talking about, magnesium, B vitamins, folate, uh, vitamin K. It's just stuff people aren't getting enough of. They're not getting enough from their diets. And um, they gave older adults, so these were people that were 65 and older, and um, there was three different trials of this study. It was called the COSMO trial. And there's about 5,000 participants in total. And the evidence was clear that just giving them a multivitamin improved cognition. And it slowed brain aging, which was it, it was estimated to slow brain aging by about two years. And I, this is like, it's so, it's it's funny because 10 years ago, I was like doing, I was out there podcast talk, you know, talking on podcast about huge studies that were coming out saying enough is enough. Multivitamins are a waste of money. Don't buy them. And they were saying the exact opposite. And they were terrible studies. And I like tore them apart. Uh, but here we are 10 years later, complete full opposite, circle, baby. full circle. What's the easiest thing you can do? Like, does that mean a young person can take a multivitamin? And it's going to immediately make them, you know, I probably not. At 20 but IQ it's insurance. Points. Yeah, it's it's something that you can start now. And certainly older adults, it made a difference. So that that's one. Mm -hmm. Um, another one is, again, I mentioned that there's other, these phytochemicals in plants that are beneficial. They're in vegetables and they're in fruits. So blueberries, 
uh, blueberry extract or even the equivalent of one cup of blueberries. This has been done. Like the equivalent of one cup of blueberries improves cognition, executive function. It inc- it improves um, memory, um, also processing speed. So that's something like if you're like, you know, uh, fast reaction time. I guess it's more relevant for like maybe someone who's athletic. But, you know fine motor coordination, things like that. Um, Multiple studies showing this. I mean, there's been meta-analyses showing it. This is across the lifespan. There's been studies in kids. There's been studies in middle-aged adults. And there's been studies in older adults. And it's clear. Blueberries make you smarter. And they make you feel better. At least they make me feel better. So Blueberries um, are the king of fruits. I think, I mean, it's between blueberries, raspberries, and pineapple, I think, for like the top spot in my world of fruits. Blueberries. Yeah? yeah? No, blueberries are, so they have something in them called anthocyanins, and it's what gives the blueberries their like pigmentation. Raspberries have them too. Blueberries are very concentrated in, in them. Um, they also have, so anthocyanins are a type of polyphenol. They're actually a flavonoid. They're a type of polyphenol. Polyphenols are a, a, a sort of wide class of phytochemicals. And phytochemicals, there's a lot of them, lots of different types of them. And they really are beneficial in humans. And like I said, there's randomized controlled trials comparing giving this to to a placebo. And if it was bad for you, then it would be clear, right? It's good for you. Hmm. So uh, blueberries are are at the top of the list for that, uh, for improving cognitive function. Low-hanging fruit. How easy is it to eat a cup of blueberries a day? I eat two. It's literally hard to not eat a cup of blueberries. It's hard not to. Yeah. So that that would be another one. Um, I think another one on my list would be similar to that would be cocoa polyphenols. So like from from like dark chocolate. Um, they have another type of polyphenol called catechins. And um, the best one. So there have been studies, lots of studies on this. And it, it's mixed on this. So some studies have shown benefits. They increase blood flow to the brain. They increase, you know, vascular flow. So you can get an immediate effect where, you know, if you increase blood flow to the brain, which is what exercise does, right? But we're talking low-hanging fruits, easy to do, take a pill. That would be um, something to do. It is, it's is—it's improved cognition, executive function. And there's a type called Cocovia, and I have no affiliation with them. But they've published their, they, they have studies published with their um, proprietary blend, which is, again, um, one of the highest concentrated, I would say, cocoa. Uh, flavanols out there, the catechins. Consumer labs tested them, and I've seen I've seen the data. It's it's very clear they're very high in in, in the, they just outcompete all the other brands out there, and they also have the lowest contaminants. So they're really uh, a good but expensive way to get those cocoa flavanols, which are really good. And then the other one would be for cognition would be lutein, which I mentioned earlier. It's in egg yolks, not very concentrated. It's in kale, very highly concentrated in kale, almost 24 milligrams in three kale leaves. And I say three kale leaves because that's what I put in my smoothie. Mm. So I've calculated it. But um, so there's 24 milligrams of lutein. So lutein is a type of carotenoid like beta carotene, like lycopene in tomatoes. You've heard of those things before. Well, lutein is in that same category. It is a carotenoid. It accumulates in the rods and the cones of your eye. It protects against singlet oxygen from blue light, like this light we're looking at, and also the sunshine when you go outside. That damages our eyes. It causes macular degeneration. And so lutein and zeaxanthin is another carotenoid. They're in greens, and they protect against that. But they also accumulate in the brain. And um, there have been a variety of studies. So there's been observational studies correlating plasma levels of lutein and zeaxanthin with certain cognitive scores. So like crystallized intelligence, older adults that have lutein and zeaxanthin higher levels have more crystallized intelligence. So that's the ability to use all the information you learned over a lifetime and like use it. (laughs) Um, There's been randomized controlled trials looking at giving eight milligrams of lutein. Now I said 24 is in three kale. So they give eight milligrams of lutein and something like 23 milligrams of zeaxanthin to older adults, and it improves neural neural efficiency. So this is the ability to, basically, your, your neurons can function with less energy, which is nice. So that obviously improves cognitive function because it's a very energy-demanding process. So, so lutein uh, is another choline. one. Yeah, I know it's in eggs. Choline, yeah. yeah. You know, cholinergics generally very important for brain function. It is, yeah. It's it's an important um, it's important for brain. And there's been studies actually um, with pregnant women. If you give pregnant women about 500 milligrams of choline per day, 
their children score better on intel um the <laughs> intelligence no test yes so oh so i learned God. about this of course when i was pregnant and i was like well it was actually before i was pregnant but i was like figuring out like what i'm gonna do like what do i need yeah and that's why i ate so many eggs during pregnancy because i also supplemented but now you've got like mastermind babies i do yeah <laughs> wow but so choline is also important yeah for sure brain function but that it comes down to again getting trying to get everything you need from your food um and then omega-3s there's been so many randomized control trials on omega-3s improving cognition especially when they're it's it, it has to be two grams or more that's where you'll get the the mixed data if it's like oh we gave them 500 milligrams it wasn't enough so the studies that are consistently showing improvements in cognitive function are at least two grams a day of the omega-3 so that's my that's my sort of, I think, low hanging fruit for for cognitive function things you can do. Is that the same strategy for battling neurodegeneration over time as well? The things that improve cognitive function yeah. now, it's just the same. It's one and the same. It's very similar because I mentioned brain derived neurotrophic factor (BDNF) that plays a huge role in battling neurodegenerative disease risk. Um, a lot of the the anthocyanins, the, the catechins that are in things like blueberries and chocolate, um, dark chocolate, especially when you concentrate the powder down, those are, they have anti-inflammatory pro like properties, they have antioxidant properties, and they're increasing blood flow to the brain as well. So they're getting more oxygen to the brain, they're getting more nutrients to the brain, all those things play a role in both sh short-term health, but also long-term brain health as well. So it's it's both, for yeah. sure. They're They're very much connected. What happens when people get brain fog? Like, what is, what is what is brain fog? I know what it feels like, but like, what's what's going on? Um, yeah, so brain fog, or as I like to call it, uh, a reduction in mental clarity. Um, and I such say a that, doctor way of reducing. Like, <laughs> I've just heard too many like people say like brain fog, brain fog, like, and it's just, I I got like this like I was telling you I got this knee jerk reaction to like you've got brain I, fog ick. I do when people like say brain fog, I'm like, oh no. You know, but yes, it is a thing. So it's, um, you know, when when you have a reduction in a mental clarity, it feels like this brain fog. And, you know, there I personally think it all comes down to food. I think it really comes down to food. Now, I mean, when you're sick, you have brain fog, but we can talk about how it overlaps with that. So I think there's really two big it, it all has to do with meals and, and, and eating Um so the first thing I think that's highly involved in this reduction in mental clarity or brain fog, as people like to call it, is what's called the postprandial glucose response. So that means blood glucose levels going up after a meal. And um, what happens is this, if you have a really high postprandial glucose response, you're eating a high glycemic index food, something that's definitely like a refined carbohydrate, for example, that'll really smash you. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to get this really sharp peak in glucose and then like a drop and or a sugar crash, as people like to call it. Um, and so it's really hard for your brain to to be functioning properly with that postprandial glucose response. And that's partly why you'll hear a lot of anecdotes and myself included, people that have tried a ketogenic diet or I used to always like to do podcasts on a in a fasted state because um, you're not getting that postprandial glucose response is one thing. It, it really sort of it it's evens it evens out. it out. Yep. Not everyone responds well to a ketogenic diet, and I certainly uh, don't think it's easy to continue on forever. So there are other things. Um, obviously, ref avoiding refined carbohydrates is uh, is an easy no brainer, right? There's nothing in there anyways. What do you need from there? Nothing. No micronutrients, you, no protein, right? Like you're not getting anything from that. So that would be one thing to avoid because that'll make sure you're not going super super high. But you can still have it um, from 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 a meal. And um, some of the things that you can do to mitigate that one would be exercise snacks. So this is like doing a really short burst of intense like vigorous exercise, eighty percent max heart rate for like one to three minutes and you do it 30 minutes or up 30 minutes up to an hour either before or after a meal so you kind of do it within this hour before or after a meal and what happens is that vigorous intensity exercise while you're you know shooting your heart rate up you know and it's, it's hard to do you're you're increasing lactate and it doesn't take much it gets soaked up by the muscle and this is then um, causing transporters, glucose transporters to come up to the muscle and opening the gates basically. Mm -hmm. So that when you eat that meal, the glucose goes into your muscle, 
it's more anabolic. You want it to go there. And it's not, you're not getting that like huge rise and then drop in the post with the postprandial glucose response. So that okay. would be the one thing. Exercise snacks. Yep. Lots of studies out there, especially with people with type 2 diabetes have a problem, you know, maintaining their blood glucose levels. The second thing would be food order. Like the order you eat your macronutrients. On the plate? Kind of. So so I would say about 10 minutes. It, ca- it can be on the plate depending on how slow you eat. So if, so if food order, um, there's been studies, again, largely in people with type 2 diabetes who have issues regulating their blood glucose. If you eat protein or fat 10 to 30 minutes before carbohydrates, it can very much blunt and slow the postprandial glucose response. So if you have like, let's say you eat a can of sardines before you're going to go to a restaurant, you're going to eat out, you're Mm. presumably going to eat more terribly than you would if you're cooking at home, right? Or you do a little protein shake 20 minutes before you're going to go to a restaurant or whatever. And that'll, or or before, like even just if you're going to do a podcast and you need mental clarity, you want to make sure that let's say just eat the protein and and not have the, the carbohydrates, right? Um, so what that does is it's, I mean, it's doing essentially like increasing insulin so that when you do have that glucose, it's, it's going. prepped. It's well, I mean, prepped. if you were, if you were going out for dinner, presumably something else you could do is try and have the starter be a steak tartare, tuna tartare, oysters, something like that. And just be like, can we just wait an extra 10 minutes on mains? Like however long you think that we need, just give us another ten, and then you've encapsulated it within the the entire meal. I guess as long as everybody else is on board with that, otherwise someone's had a bunch of bread and they're just they want the whatever main course to come out. But, See that they should. That's like the worst thing is having the bread on the table first, right? Yeah, but it it's should so be. Good. It is good, but like eat the pro, eat the steak tartare first, and then go for the bread, right? You'll 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 slow the glucose response. There's a place in Austin called Dean's Italian. Uh, it's just down the street from you. Ah, you should go. You should Dean's go. Dean's Italian. Yeah, I yeah. Need, I'm looking for restaurant recommendations. Please, I'll send you some. Send me this. some more. Yeah. So uh, Dean's, Three Forks, and um, the somewhere else that I went the other evening that was phenomenal. But Dean's, Dean's and Three Forks are the uh, two steak restaurants I go to the most. Uh, but Dean's do this. They call it a bread crown. So it's like a literally looks like a little crown that comes out kind of about that size. And there's a pot of whipped butter in the middle of this thing. And it's glazed on top. It's got like a salt glaze. This thing is like crack. It's so good. And it's it's just there. You arrive, you sit down, you've got the drinks or whatever, and then this thing arrives and you just can't, it's impossible to not eat. Yeah. So yeah, almost getting, is there something that we can do with this like pre-appetizer appetizer to come after the appetizers around about 15 minutes, if that's okay, because Dr. Rhonda said so. Yeah, so food order, you know, is is something legitimately that's been studied, empirical data showing it does blunt the glucose, postprandial glucose response. Hmm. And um, so that is another thing that can really, I think, affect mental clarity or brain fog. So um, just like I said, like the protein or, or fat, like an avocado, sometimes I'll have an avocado. And that kind of just delays the emptying of your stomach into your intestines, and it kind of slows it even keel rather than real high spike and then lower. In other news, this episode is brought to you by AG1. Nutrition doesn't have to be complicated, it just has to work. And that's why I've used AG1 every single day for over three years now. AG1 is literally the best in the world at providing you with a scientifically backed blend of ingredients that helps to fuel your body. You might have heard Tim Ferriss and Joe Rogan and Peter Atiyah and Andrew Huberman and myself talk about this product and that's because it is the best daily foundational nutrition supplement on the planet. AG1 is a comprehensive nutrition solution formulated to support whole body health. It's got 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients. Best of all, it's got a 90 day money back guarantee. So you can buy it and try it every single day for three full months. And if you do not like it at the end of those three months, they will give you your money back. That's how confident they are that you'll love it. Right now, you can get a year's free supply of vitamin D plus five free travel packs by going to the link in the description below or heading to drinkag1.com slash wisdom. That's drinkag1.com slash wisdom. Presumably as well, prioritizing the foods during an eating window, even if you do the protein shake at home and then go out for dinner afterward, prioritizing that and skewing that toward protein is just going to cause you to eat less of the carbs. If there is dessert at the end, you're going to think, well, I'm like not as bothered because I've just put more in me that's been skewed and discriminated in the direction of what 
you should be prioritizing anyway. Absolutely. So you get more, you, it's satiety plays a role. I mean, if like you're eating something before like protein, you're just not going to eat as much. You know, you're not going to eat as much. But that kind of leads into the second, that's not the only part of the meal or food or eating that I think plays a role in this reduction in mental clarity and brain fog. The other thing is the postprandial inflammatory response. So eating a meal causes inflammation. It happens in everyone, every meal. It's no, there's no avoiding it. Like to some degree it happens. And, but you can minimize like how much of an inflammatory response you're having. So people um, eating a very high sugar and high fat meal, it really, that's the real, those are the two real big movers of it. Mm. Um, But even if you're just doing a ton of fat without like fiber or protein, fat is harsh on the gut. And so what ends up happening is your gut epithelial cells, there's like things holding them together, tight junctions, they open up and they let little pieces of bacteria. So our microbiome, I mean, we got trillions. Is it leaky gut? Is exactly what it is. It's intestinal permeability and it allows pieces of bacteria to get into for your every, circuit. For every like bro science term I've got, you've got the specific term that comes out of medicine. Is it brain fog? It's a reduction in mental clarity. <laughs> is it leaky gut? It's a, the, the wall lining of the intestine is opened up to a... Like, <laughs> yeah, intestinal permeability or leaky gut as it's called. Yeah. That's what you're doing. So meals cause that to happen transiently. Uh, some people have like a very big problem with leaky gut, but so transiently you're letting bacteria get into your bloodstream. And this is what happens is is, is, is pieces of bacteria. They're called endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide, the same thing. But um, they're getting into your circulation because they're opening up, right? Getting yep, from the gut. Into, not supposed to be there, right? And your immune system gets activated. So your immune system's like, it, it, it knows those pieces of the bacterial membrane. It recognizes it. That's how it, you know, recognizes a bacterial and pathogen. And so it gets activated. And um, what ends up happening there is, one, your immune system's activated, okay? That requires a ton of energy. So energy is shunted away from your brain, and it goes to the immune system because your body goes, triages it, goes, I need to survive. There's a bacteria, there's a bacterial invader in my system right now. I'm going to take all my energy, and I'm going to make sure that I get rid of this invader so I don't die, right? So that's that's the first thing that's happening in terms of, like, energy is being diverted from the brain, from neurotransmission, from thinking everything, and it's going to the immune system to activate it. Okay, and it doesn't, you know, happen for that long of a period, but it, it's happening after a meal. Um, the second thing that's happening is that your immune system itself is creating cytokines that are activating other immune cells. That's how they like talk to each other. And these things are, um, they're essentially can be somnogenic. So they can make you sleepy. So mm. when you're sick, what happens when you're sick? You're, you have no energy, right? Because all the energy is going to your immune cytokine system. Cytokine response. And you're sleepy. Yep. So that's exactly what's happening after a meal. What's happening when you're sick to a smaller degree is happening after a meal. The post and post-prandial inflammatory response. And then the other thing that's happening is those cytokines also are crossing into your brain and disrupting neurotransmission, disrupting connections. Like we now know that it's the blood-brain barrier does not keep immune molecules out. It gets in, they get in there and they're wreaking havoc. So it's another reason why you don't want to have, you know, inflammatory, a lot of inflammation. But so then the question is, okay, what do I do, right? So that's the question. How do I not get such a big post-prandial inflammatory response? And it's also, again, why a lot of people, myself included, always feel like more mentally clear when I'm fasted, fasted. Yeah. right? Uh, but I'm like, oh, I don't want to lose the protein. I mean, the, the muscle mass, so I need to get yeah. some yeah, food. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the question is, what do you do? One, obviously avoid the sugar, high sugar, high fat. Okay, that's clear. Two, um, smaller meals have less of a postprandial inflammatory response. So the bigger the meal, the bigger the response. Spike. And then, Spike and then down. Yeah, but yep. it's like well, now we're talking, you're, you're getting both. You're getting the glucose and you're getting the inflammatory response. Yep. The, that's another thing. So actually like smaller meals does help that. So like if you need mental clarity and stuff, like don't have a big meal. Um, and the other thing that actually makes an effect on that is, believe it or not, we're going full circle, omega-3. Omega-3 has been shown in clinical studies to blunt the post post prandial inflammatory response with the meal or at any point throughout the day so that's why i take my omega-3s throughout the day with meals and it's doing it it, it, to some degree both Mm -hmm. to some degree both something systemic but there's also something acute exactly there's something systemic the inflammation process but there's something acute in the gut that it's also playing a role in preventing the lipopolysaccharide from getting the circulation is there a is this dose dependent if i have one gram with each meal, you say two grams of triglycerides responsibly sourced, blah, 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 from a Norwegian guy that's doing it like this with fish. 
can I have one gram with each meal? Would that be sufficient? I think the studies, and I can't remember, I think it was like they were lower dose, like 500 milligrams. I think it wasn't even that high. So hmm. I typically do the one gram with each meal. I think that's a safe. It's a nice way to remember to do it. But yeah, it's a nice day. way. And um, and that's so, so I like to do, the reason I like to have omega-3s throughout the day is for one, that reason, blunting the postprandial inflammatory response. Two, I want these like specialized resolving, like these specialized um, resolving molecules in that they produce, like when you're metabolizing in my blood, constant yeah. resolving inflammation. Very working. interesting. So. Yeah. So through uh, throughout my 20s, I said I was a, a club promoter and I I thought I had depression or like acute depression that would come on every so often, like intermittently throughout the year. I think looking back, it was just low mood and burnout. I think that's what was going on. But the way that it would manifest for me is I wouldn't get out of bed. I wouldn't want to go to work and see people. And I was the, I was in charge of this company, so I could do whatever I wanted and no one could tell me otherwise. But one of the things that I would do is I would order pizza or like high sugar foods and sweets and stuff like that. And it would comfort eat, right? Like I'd comfort eat and that would be something I'd do. But I'd notice, especially if you have, you know, a big Domino's in front of you and you've got some sweet stuff to have after that, the sense that you get in your body, especially if you haven't been outside, if you've basically not moved because you're feeling a little bit miserable and you, the curtains are drawn and you've just laid in bed and the Uber driver or whatever's come and you've taken the food off him, the inflammation, like the throbbing that you feel in your body, it's almost like your heartbeat feels like, or your blood pressure feels like it's gone up. And then almost all of the time after that, and I think this is very common for people that deal with low mood, if they do comfort eat like that, they'll then fall asleep. So shortly after that, and then that dysregulation of your sleep pattern also makes you feel even more like shit. And then you come out of this sleep, your emotions are all over the place. You've still got tons of like either blood sugar rushing around you or you don't, or you've got digestive discomfort because you've just eaten all of this food. And um, yeah, just seeing that as like a little uh, Petri dish microcosm for what happens, it, the least amount of movement possible. Like you've gone from bed to door, back to bed, and that's it nothing in terms of any kind of stimulation already in low mood and then you go to sleep the most sedentary of all of the positions uh yeah it's you can feel that inflammation that cytokine response and your thoughts again super super muddy which more so um feeds back into that low mood it's a vicious cycle right exactly no and you mentioned it's funny how you mentioned people get when you get sleepy after a meal it's like that's the cytokines that are somnogenic it's the post inflammatory infl inflammatory response mm -hmm. and again how it happens with the bigger meal too you'll notice like the bigger the meal if you overeat the sleepier you are right yeah. and so it, it's more of an inflammatory response so now you can think about it as oh i'm not sleepy it's oh i'm i've got some inflammation going on after that meal we interesting <laughs> what about improving mood what do people get wrong when thinking about that? I mean, so improving mood is, you know, we were talking about exercise and, and, and that would be the most effortful way that you can improve mood. And there's studies that have compared it to like running to essentially to standard SSRI treatments, which are pretty classic um, antidepressants that are used. And it's performed as good as an SSRI with added health benefits, of course, right? Um, so... But you met, you said something interesting when you were talking about when you were feeling depressed, um, and that was that you couldn't even get out of bed, right? You know, so there, it, it, it's clear that exercise will help mitigate depression. It'll improve your mood. Very clear. But not everyone is going to go for a run. Not everyone that is depressed will get on the Peloton or fill in the blank type of exercise, right? There are some people that, like, it's hard to get out of bed. So what could be a non-pharmacological treatment to help improve mood, right? Um, and I think that this is what is super exciting. And this comes into to heat, deliberate heat exposure and, and sauna. And it's something I personally experienced firsthand when I was in graduate school. I was uh, extremely stressed out, which can manifest with depression, anxiety, right? Like you, those are all come connected. And this was like 2009. I started using the sauna every day before I would go into the lab. And I all of a sudden was, you know, handling my failed experiments better. I was like handling the stress for my advisor and just all the things I had to do so much better. I mean, it was so noticeable that I initially went, oh, my gosh, there, there's something going on here. Like, I need to figure this out. Um, and so that's what initially even got me interested in the sauna was the effect on my mood. And at the time, I like I 
published on this since. I published on this back in uh, 2022. But I had come up with some theories about there's lots of reasons why Um, I had come up with with a theory on it affecting the opioid system or natural endogenous opioid system. So when you get in the sauna um, or when you're under, you know, deliberate heat exposure, say a hot bath, something similar, you release endorphins. And that's the feel good opioid that you when you're running, you know, same thing. Um, but you also release something that's the opposite of that. It's called dynorphin. And that is the opioid that's responsible for that discomfort feeling, that dysphoric feeling like, it's hot. This is miserable. I it's hate miserable. it. Why am I doing Why? this to yes. myself? Yeah. Exactly. And that's when you're running. What It, it, it happens during physical activity as well. And um, and so what it does, it actually cools down your core body temperature somewhat. And that's why it's like a natural response. And um, but when you release that discomfort feeling, there's a feedback loop. It actually tell it actually you actually make more receptors and you make them more sensitive to the feel good endorphins so that you feel better later. And um, so now there's been um, some scientific research first from Charles Raison back in, I think it was like 2016. He had done a study where people were, they basically like, it was a type of, of sauna, more like an infrared sauna. It was elevating their core body temperature to about feverish state, like a 101.3. And there was a sham control, which was the placebo. They were getting hot enough to think they were getting the treatment, but it wasn't raising them. It wasn't giving them a fever. And so um, that was done just one time. And this was in people with major depressive disorder, like this, like legit depression. And the people that got the active you know, sauna treatment had an antidepressant effect that lasted six weeks after one time, right? No so, way. Yeah, one time. Um, so now Dr. Ashley Mason at UCSF, um, she's running the Osher Center, which is they do a lot of non-pharmacological treatments for a lot of stuff. And um, I, I've been lucky enough to collaborate with her on uh, some of these studies where she now right now has a paper in press, which I'm I'm sorry, in uh, peer review. Um, But she basically trained with Chuck Raison and carried on the torch and now has done either four treatments or eight treatments in some people and looked. And these are people, again, um, with depression and did a battery of, of scores, you know, that these people do when they're measuring depression. And it's just off the charts unreal like so damn exciting like i can't tell you how exciting it is the people that got this sauna treatment i mean they i think it's something like the hamilton score where you need like a, a three or four point change for it to be significant i mean yep. these people are changing like 16 points and ssris i think are only two two or three i don't know what they are it's but not, it's not loads it, it I, I all i can say is she's doing an infrared sauna and hers is um it's a head out infrared sauna so it's like it's like a dome Mm, and, I've seen those. People look so funny. And yes, but they're but they're in there for a very long time. Have you considered getting... that it's just them overcoming the discomfort of looking so stupid while being in one of those tents that has your head sticking out the top? Yeah, there's probably so many mechanisms at play, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I but but you know, there's there's some argument to be made for head out. You know, we could get into that. But like, I okay. I, th- I do think that. Inflammation. So sauna does what exercise is doing, and to some degree, it, with respect to you know causing both acute inflammation, but having a strong anti-inflammatory response. But then I think the opioids could be involved. There's so many things. Like it's not known what's happening. Exercise, get hot. If you can get hot while you exercise, probably also. If you can do both, yeah. but but getting hot, like some people like again, getting into a sauna is like getting into a spa. It's a lot easier to go from your bed into this other little chamber where you're just lying. There's no down. effort. Right. Yep. No, there's no effort. There's discomfort, the heat's doing no it for effort. you. The heat's doing it for you. We'll get back to talking to Rhonda in one minute, but first I need to tell you about Element. Stop having coffee first thing in the morning. Your adenosine system that caffeine acts on isn't even active for the first 90 minutes of the day, but your adrenal system is, and salt acts on your adrenal system. Each grab and go stick contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio of sodium, potassium, and magnesium with no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, or any other junk that helps to regulate your appetite, curb cravings, and improve your brain function. But best of all, it takes phenomenal. This orange salt is like a salty, sweet, beautiful nectar that I look forward to having every single day and it makes me perform better. Also, they've got a no BS, no questions asked refund policy so you can buy it completely risk-free and if you don't like it for any reason, they'll give you your money back and you don't even have to return the box. Right now, you can get a free sample pack of all eight element flavors with your first box by going to the link in the description below or heading to drinklmnt.com slash modernwisdom. That's drinklmnt.com slash modern wisdom. What about people who are at standardly acceptable mood 
uh, but think I really want to kind of elevate the way that I feel throughout the day. I don't, I, I just don't feel that sort of excited or fired up about that. Obviously, there's like, what are your relationships like? What's the job that you do? Do you have meaning and purpose in your life? Et cetera, all of those sorts of things. But are there any interventions from a physiological perspective where you think this is something that you should prioritize? Right. Um, so I think that it, it comes down to obviously like doing an exercise snack. We talked about exercise, just doing like a two minute, you know, high knees or squats or something. It makes a difference. It really does. You're getting you're getting that oxygen to your brain. You're getting more nutrients, and BDNF plays a role in depression. So that stuff, I think, immediately improves mood. But there's also, um, you know, so so what neurotransmitters are involved in mood, or you know, mood? Yeah, what is and, mood when we talk about it? Well, I mean, it's complicated. Like I don't even know that we can define it exactly, right? I mean, there's there's you get, you have things like serotonin. It's involved in mood, uh, motivation. Like you have to be in a good mood to be motivated, right? They're they're really hand in hand. Same with dopamine. Norepinephrine is another one that's involved. Focus, attention, mood. Uh, you know things like that. They're all sort of, you know, involved in the in the mood, motivation, that sort of pathways. So there's like a, a there are behaviors that you can engage in to sort of optimize for those neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitter optimization is is sort of like trying to engage in behaviors that can optimize for those neurotransmitters. So one, high intensity exercise does it. It's been shown. Serotonin goes up. It goes up because, again, your lactate is increasing the serotonin, but it also goes up because branch chain amino acids, which you're getting when you're eating protein, they compete with tryptophan. Tryptophan is a precursor. It has to get into the brain. And they compete for transport into the brain with those branched chain amino acids. And tryptophan is a precursor for serotonin. So if you're eating a bunch of protein, which have branched chain amino acids like leucine, isoleucine, things that are building muscle basically, and you're not exercising, then your tryptophan can be outcompeted. And there's been studies mm -hmm. doing this. Mm -hmm. they've, given, they've given people a big like shake, like a protein shake essentially, that does not have any... Um, Trip, it has no tryptophan in it. So they're essentially just dosing them with branched chain amino acids and their tryptophan levels fall by like 90% in the brain and, and subsequently their serotonin levels plummet and people get in a terrible mood. Their long-term planning shuts down. So serotonin plays a role in impulse control, like being able to like control your impulses and not engage in behaviors that are just very imp impulsive. Um, and so that, that goes down and it's, it's just normal people that you know, are drinking this shake of branched chain amino acids. So what makes the branched chain amino acids go into muscle? Exercise. So if you want to do that, then you're going to get more tryptophan in the brain to make serotonin. What is the adaptive justification or the adaptive mechanism for this? Is it that if human was doing relatively high intensity extended exercise, that would often be some sort of pursuit hunting type thing? Therefore, you need a natural painkiller to encourage said human to keep chasing said wildebeest because if they feel better they will keep chasing it which means they're more likely to catch it which means they won't starve and die that sounds like a great explanation <laughs> um yeah i mean we used to move around like you said um it, it doesn't necessarily have to be high intensity it could be just lifting weights too it causes branch chain amino acids to be taking up to muscle but you're you're moving yeah so there there's a you know i think there's a could be an evolutionary you know reason why there um, is for every in my there world is. there is an evolutionary reason for absolutely everything not because it's the only thing i've got any expertise in uh but yeah that's that's interesting to think about i mean i, I wrote this like 10 years ago when i was still suffering with low mood and stuff like that that if you gave me the choice between a good night's sleep of nine hours or a hard training session of one hour my mood reset before and after training is greater than before and after sleep i found more bleed from pre to post sleep than pre to post training and it's it's so ruthless that if you are suffering with a low mood or if you're under a period of high stress or whatever it is one of the things that you go to first is sleep even though in my experience the higher roi thing is the thing that's hardest to do when your mood's the lowest because your motivation to do difficult things is also at its lowest totally absolutely it's funny that you mentioned the sleep thing too because like you know i, I do think sleep is important but nowadays I'm like, you know, it's exercise. Like, like, I don't know that anything matters as much if you are putting in that effort to exercise. And, you know, that could be 
it's shown in data. If you look at, you know, studies that have looked at all cause mortality and people that don't, you know, sleep as much, like they're getting six hours or less, they have a higher all cause mortality than people that are not sleep, but only in people that are not physically active. So people that are physically active and sleep terribly had the same all cause mortality as people that were, you know, slept fine without. So in other words, oh, interesting. exercise can negate the bad effects of lack of sleep on all cause mortality. And I also glucose response goes up with lack of sleep like you're 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 um you're basically gonna have a higher postprandial glucose response to food yep. you're gonna have a higher fasting blood glucose level when you don't get enough sleep well you're also going to select for foods that are more salty more sweet i mean i found this as well that i i for the first time in my entire life when i had a stable sleep and wake pattern was covid that was the first time that i'd ever gone to bed as an adult the same time most nights out of two weeks because I was always running our events, you know, which would mean I'd be up until two, three, five in the morning, cashing up a till, driving back from one of the club nights in a different city, doing something like that. And I remember thinking, like, I always thought that I had low mood and was a bad sleeper. And I just realized I was doing shift work. The shift work is considered, I think the World Health Organization literally considers shift work a health risk. So this is uh, firefighters, this is nurses, this is anybody that's got an irregular pattern. And um, I, I thought that was me. I was like, oh, this is, it was so formative and such a foundation to the way that my uh, lifestyle and uh, the texture of my mind existed. That I didn't, I couldn't imagine what life would be like different. And then COVID comes in and obviously nightclubs will immediately all get shut down. And I'm like, well, I guess I, guess I'll try this going to bed at 11 o'clock every night thing. And then mood started to just like linearly get better throughout all of 2020. And uh, yeah, that was wild to see that, that case study of someone who basically had no theory of mind for what it would be like to not be like that, to then actually get stable sleep and wake was, it was crazy. It was a really big change. Yeah, that's it. It really is. Like you said, the shift work. I mean, I'm so respectful for people that are doing it. And um, Sachin Panda has actually done research, work with like firefighters and stuff and shown that if the shift workers do time restricted feeding and eating, like the, if they're doing that while they're doing their shift work, they actually do have better, at least like metabolic um, outcomes and stuff like or not by outcomes, but um, biomarkers. So That's there is somewhat. So so it helps because, you know, they're obviously their body is completely out of cycle and whack. But if they can at least keep that food intake clock mm. on the right you know, path and right clock, uh, it, it does make a difference. So they're not eating all around the clock, basically. Presumably, if they were also doing training, if it they were exercising, that would help to mitigate, mitigate, Absolutely. mitigate. I think the exercise would be the most important thing those, that they could do. And firefighters, I mean, they are, they do have to be physically fit, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. that's part of like the requirement. So um, I think a firefighter is basically like being a, a, a halfway house into the armed forces. Like a lot of my friends that are there, that, you know, they have uh pt they have yard time they have kit inspections they have all this sort of stuff i don't know whether it's the same i don't think it's the same for people that are accident and emergency uh nurses and 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 doctors and stuff like that uh i don't know if it's the same for the police i guess if you're part of a swat team and stuff that would that would be very heavily prioritized but i don't know if the you know the classic bobby on the beat with a big gut and a, i'm thinking british here and like one of the silly hats that are British police officers were. I don't know whether they're put through the same kind of uh, fitness. I suppose their job sometimes is less physically demanding than a firefighter's. But then if you're chasing some scally down a, an alleyway and chasing after some person that's just committed a crime, you need to be pretty fit for that. But yeah, it's super, super interesting. Uh, when we're talking about cold and heat exposure, which is something that you've spent an awful lot of time thinking about, what's the best way to utilize cold and heat routine throughout a week? Like what's just the, the simplest way to do an evidence-based cold and heat protocol? I think um, one of the best ways would be if, you, so most people should be training, right? They should be doing some sort of resistance training or endurance training, uh, vigorous exercise. Doing the heat after that, I think would be one of the best because you're you're extending your workout to some degree. So there's been there's been studies looking at the on the endurance side, like if you're uh, intervention studies that have taken people that have done exercise on a stationary bike 
or they've done the same exercise in the stationary bike and then done 15 minutes of a hot sauna like right after that mm -hmm. and with basically no break with no break they just go into the sauna after and then vo2 max was measured so vo2 max is like your best way to measure cardiorespiratory fitness right so the maximum amount of oxygen you're taking in and maximal you know exercise so um the their vo2 max was better in people that did that exercise the, the stationary bike plus the sauna versus just the stationary bike right and that is a lot because sauna to some degree is mimicking moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise you know it's it's doing a lot of the same things a lot of the same physiological responses happening so i would say um doing the sauna right after the workout but also there's a new study that came out showing people that did resistance training and then got into a sauna had like better muscle gains and it just makes your workout more of whatever you did it makes sure it you know but i think some of that has to do with the heat shock proteins too and um also yeah there's been studies showing that if you um increase blood flow like like if you do resistance training it used to be like this thing where it's like oh don't do any endurance training like like at this on the same day that you're doing resistance training because you're going to blunt your gangs or something. I don't remember what it exactly was called, but that's kind of been put to rest. It's not true. Uh, so so to to well, I guess there's always extreme. There's always outlier. I should say ways you could do it. But generally speaking, like getting some blood flow to your muscles after you've done training actually improves hypertrophy, right? Because you're getting some growth factors and things there and immune cells, things that are like playing a role in the hypertrophy. Is right? there a window post training? that you need to get into the heat within? Not necessarily, no. Within the no. same day? No, I think you should do it if you, okay, you, act, you asked me about the optimal protocol. Yep. I would say optimally, it would be after training. Yep. It doesn't have to be because also heat plays a role in sleep. So pe some people choose to do their heat at night, like a couple hours before they're gonna go to bed. You can go, I actually have been kind of obsessive about this of late and I do both. So I do. I get in the sauna after I work out, and then I do the jacuzzi at night with my husband, um, which is another form of heat stress. You're in, you know, 104 degree Fahrenheit water. You can be in there for 20 minutes and get similar responses in terms of biomarkers as a sauna. So I do think um, if you're only going to do one, you can kind of choose. Like, do you have a hard time sleeping? Do you want to, or do you want to kind of extend your workout? And now I don't know that you have to do it. Like, I think there's also been observational data. By the way, the study with the cyclists and the sauna that was in untrained people. So you might go, oh, well, what about trained Noob people? Gains. Yeah. yeah. But then there's observational data showing that people that do exercise or people that exercise and sauna. So this is all sorts of people. This is These are people that are exercising. These aren't newbies, right? The people that do exercise and sauna have a higher VO2 max compared to people that only exercise mm. so there's evidence i think that that kind of makes it a little stronger that it's not just a, a newbie gain right like yeah. that it's probably something going and i think it's because it's it's mimicking cardiovascular exercise so do you have to do it after a workout no you don't have to uh but i do think it's i i personally like to do it after a workout it's like i've already got my heart rate up you know it's it's so it's really just like extending extending my so workout the, some the some two uh windows that seem to be at least interesting to use would be two hours ish finishing two hours before bed i say that yeah because some people take longer to cool down yeah me and too. i do exactly so yeah two hours like to get out before you yeah. know like because then you don't want to be like trying to go to sleep then you'll have the opposite effect right you're too hot you can't yeah. fall asleep and then post-workout so post-workout right. and a, a couple of hours before right. sleep what temperature how long per week what else yeah. So um, temperature, duration, frequency, like how many times, you know, so there's all sorts of studies coming out of Finland where saunas are ubiquitous and everyone's using one looking at, you know, sauna use and all cause mortality, cardiovascular rate of mortality, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, all those things. Right. And what's clear is that there is a dose dependent effect with frequency and duration in the sauna. So in other words, the more frequent the sauna use, the more robust of the effect. So I'll give you an example. All-cause mortality is 40% lower in people that use the sauna four to seven times a week. So four times would be minimum, right? Versus people that use it two to three times a week, they have a 24% lower all-cause mortality, right? So the bare minimum would be two if you want something. Um, this is compared to people that use it one time a week. But if you want the most robust effects, the bare minimum would be four up to seven, right, every day. 
So that would be frequency. Now, temperature and duration, most of those studies in Finland, the average temperature in the publications is about 174, 175 degree Fahrenheit. And the duration in that sauna is also important. So if people only stayed in for 11 minutes, they weren't getting a very robust effect. They had to stay in for at least 20 minutes. Mm. So 20 minutes at 174 degree Fahrenheit four times a week is the recipe for, I would say, the the best, you know, uh, effects for cardiovascular, brain, all-cause mortality. What about if you increase temperature and reduce duration? Yeah, so this question, usually I get at the opposite because people are interested in infrared saunas and infrared saunas go only to like 145 degree Fahrenheit. They mm-hmm. kind of heat you up a little differently. They're not, the ambient air is not as hot. It's like, you know, electrons that are like moving your molecules in your body up. But, mm-hmm. um, and so in that case, you would want to stay in a, a much longer duration. And that's what's used in like Ashley Mason study. But the opposite, so like if you're going to, you know, what, 180 or how how hot are we talking? Mine was 230 today. Okay, so um, heat is, so heat is a stress, re- it's, a, it's a stress on the body, right? And you have this stress response to the heat, right? So your body makes heat shock proteins, for example. You get dark thoughts. You, you get dark thoughts. Yeah, exactly. And then and then you get out and you feel great. But um, you also get chatty in there. So um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that you don't want to go too extreme on heat because it is a stress. Like, just like you don't want to like exercise like all day, like you need recovery, right? You don't want to fast like forever, like you need food. These things are stressed they're stressors on the body and our body has a stress response to them. So this is kind of like hormesis. We've talked about hormesis a lot, right? Hot, heat is the same thing. Um, heat can permeabilize the blood-brain barrier when you start to go to extreme temperatures. So you're not melting my brain. I'm concerned that that 230 is too high. Yeah. There's yeah. so there was one study that came um that was published. Is it 2022? It was kind of recent-ish. And um, it wasn't from um, Dr. Yari Laukinen's group, who is the main researcher who does a lot of studies out of Finland, uh, looking at, you know, sauna use and dementia, for example. He found sauna use is associated with like a 66% reduction in Alzheimer's disease and dementia if you're they're using it four to seven times a week. Well, another study came out, and this was in, gosh, it was quite a few. I don't remember if it was two or 5,000 adults. It was a lot. Or maybe it was more, actually. Um, well, anyways, they looked at temperature and they looked at duration and they looked at Alzheimer's disease risk. And, you know, it was clear that, you know, if you use the sauna, you had a lower degree, a lower risk of, of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. But there was a subset of group where people were using it at 200 degrees Fahrenheit or more that had the opposite effect. Wow. So you shaped curve to temperature. I think so. I don't talk about, I don't want people to get freaked out because it's like, but not everyone's doing 200. I think there's the extreme, there's always this extreme push where oh, I'm going to go hard. And if you're that personality type, you're going to be that person that goes all the way because that's what you do on everything you do. Turn the dial up. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So um, I do think with sauna though, it's important to keep in mind that it is a pretty strong stress on the body, yep. particularly if you're not head out, right? But if you're getting your head in there and warming it up to 230 degrees. Yeah. This plunge thing is really really intense i mean there's a couple of things when you think about like where's the thermometer actually located is right. it is the it highest a, point it's, it's, it's at the top unless you're stood on your tiptoes on the bench you're not actually going to get your head to that point and the difference between this one that i've got is two benches and the lower bench is way cooler half half as hard as sitting on the upper bench and the upper bench isn't at the, all the way at the top and if you're at the other side to where the rock heater thing is if you're over there then it's easier and if you're at the front then it's a bit hard so you can kind of mitigate within that i suppose um one consideration like four times a week can be quite intrusive for somebody to get that heat exposure especially if they don't even if you do have a sauna at home it's still pretty intrusive like i gotta go back and forth to the thing and preheat it and all the rest of the stuff is there a or if you were to do 20 minutes in at 180 190, something like that, uh, to make sure that it's 174, yeah. uh, and then take a little break and then go back in. Is that a way that you could maybe get away with doing three times a week or two times a week and still try and capture some of those really good gains? Um, I don't know that that 
data is there to make that statement. But I do know that there have been studies looking at going repeatedly and taking a few minutes break and going back into the sauna. And what is clear is that you do get big major boost in growth hormone. Is this the thing that 16 yeah, X increased? Yes. Tell, yes. tell us that. Yeah. So what they were doing is they were going, so they're going, I don't remember how many times, but it was quite- Four times 30 minutes with some, a break. Yeah, with break, something yep. like that. Yeah. So it's been years since I've talked about that study, but yeah. So, um, and that that could give 16 fold increase in growth hormone, which, you know, it does. it's transient. It doesn't like last forever, but, you know, also growth hormones involved with sleep. And in deep sleep. And so it's it's another reason why doing that, like timing your sauna around around bedtime mm -hmm. could be highly beneficial for a lot of people. Like a lot of people really do benefit. So I personally, like I said, I do I kind of do both. I did like the I do the hot tub, um, which is 104 degrees, and I'm in there for like 30 minutes. And but the difference being that it's 104 degrees of liquid touching your exactly, skin. Exactly. No. And there's been studies that have looked at so there's heat shock proteins that are activated. Um, in the sauna, and they're also activated in the hot tub. And brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is from exercise, also is activated when you get in a hot tub. So, and and the sauna. So it's like you, when you start to see the biomarkers that are similar between the different heat modalities, you kind of go, "Well, at the end of the day, is your heart rate going up in the hot tub?" Yes. It's like mm -hmm. I've been I've done the sauna for like years and years and years and years. I like I know how I feel. I feel the exact same way in the sauna. I like the the sauna better because I'm less likely to cheat. Like I will cheat in a hot tub. I will get my arms out. Yeah. I will, yeah like yeah, you have yeah, to yeah. have your shoulders down for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So you have to really Didn't like- Didn't you, uh, I saw you on Twitter get into a, you got in trouble with big steam, like the steam room versus uh, sauna versus jacuzzi thing. I think there's a lot of people that are like evangelists for the sauna being the only way to get hot. And I think that you'd mentioned there's quite a lot of different ways that you can get there's hot. There's a lot of different ways you can get hot. And I think, I mean, I've done- a lot of steam showers again you're getting your heart rate up you're you're getting you're increasing your uh, cardiac output you're getting blood flow increases you're sweating mm. like all these things are happening it's it's the heat shock response you're you know there's a lot of ways what is it the a lot of roads to a lot of roads to rome yeah, right yeah, i mean yeah. it's not would uh, if somebody doesn't have uh, access to easy easy access to a sauna or doesn't have one in the house what about just running a hot bath and then continuing to like, I, I, I mean, how much is a thermometer that you put in the bath? It'd probably $5, maybe $10 or something. Throw that in, get it at what temperature and stay in for 20 minutes. Exactly. I do this a lot when I'm traveling, by the way. Like I get, I do the- um, The portable sauna. I do, yeah. I do it. Um, but so what I what I like to, to recommend is like, so go and get one of those pool thermometers, right? I mean, they're like you said, they're like anywhere between five to $15. The little floaty ones. The little floaty ones. You put that in your bathtub and you get it up to 104, set your timer for 20 minutes, make your make sure your shoulders are down, like submerged below. And if the the, the temperature starts to go down, just add some more hot water. And that's that's it. Most most people have a bathtub. And so I like that it can be accessible because that's another thing I get a lot of. Oh, well, I don't have a sauna. Privileged I can't. position. Yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah, there's a lot of gyms, but this isn't Finland. Like we're, you know, everyone has a sauna. You know, so, so I do realize that there's a limitation on the saunas and you might go, well, then why do I need to, like, do I need it? You know, like I said, so there's the VO2 max, you know, that you're getting, you're getting even better than just exercise. Mm -hmm. Now there's people out there that are endurance athletes, like they're, I don't know, do they need it like for VO2 max? Probably not. But it also helps with disuse atrophy, muscle atrophy. Um, and those studies have been done. So they've done studies where they do like this, they immobilize a limb in people mm -hmm. for like a period of weeks. And they did local heating in, in one study, but there's been a lot of animal studies doing sort of whole body heating. And it'll prevent disuse atrophy by like 40%. I snapped my Achilles three years ago, full detachment, playing cricket. And <clears throat> it was 13 days from when that happened until when I got my surgery. Uh, so I'm waiting for, I wanted a very particular surgeon in the UK to come and do it, one of the the guys that had been highly recommended to me, which meant I had to wait a little bit longer. 13 days of not stepping on my right leg and it was gone. It was so alarming to look down and see, especially because you've got the other leg to fucking compare it to. So you're laid in the bath or whatever, looking down and thinking, like, this is 
wild. It's so crazy. And obviously you see people that are in wheelchairs who maybe don't use their lower limbs all that much and they've got very thin legs. And yeah, it was it was crazy to see that in 13 days. Well, you were young yes. when you, this happened. And so you can recover, you can bounce back quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but people that are older, like they go and they get influenza and they're like, convalescing for like weeks right they're not moving they're not using their muscles they can't recover like they'll never get back to that, that pre so state scary. and and this is where i think the heat comes in and also omega-3s so i know oh, it's damn, like omega-3 it's like i can't like like there's like there's like a few low-hanging fruit right this it's episode like is brought to you by <laughs> omega-3s <laughs> But it, it's been shown to cut disuse atrophy by like 50%. So, and this, but this is something that's not going to happen. Like you have to preload it. So you have to, it, it, the omega-3s accumulate in the muscle membranes mm. and it takes about four weeks for that to happen. So you have to plan ahead or just be the person that's already taking them. That way it's already there. Right. And so then you're ready. Talk to me about cold. We've got hot. Cold, yeah. Cold exposure. Yeah, so deliberate cold exposure um, is another type of hormetic stress, and there's some overlap, but there's different – like you can increase heat shock proteins from cold exposure. Heat shock – these stress response pathways, there's a lot of overlap where you can like – because it's just it's it's an it's an adaptation, right? We were meant to move. We were meant to be hot. We were meant to be cold. We were meant to get plant phytochemicals. We're there, you know. Our our bodies respond and we activate all these really beneficial genetic pathways. So they all kind of overlap. Some do it better than others. Like heat shock proteins are more robustly activated by heat, but cold also activates them. Just an interesting thing to to think about. Um, so cold exposure, one of the most robust physiological responses to cold res cold exposure would be norepinephrine release. And we were talking uh, earlier about mood and like neurotransmitter optimization, things to do, like ha behaviors you can engage in and, and timing of those behaviors around things that are, you know, perhaps um, going to require a better mood or more motivation or something like that, right? So norepinephrine does play a role in, in, in motivation and mood and those things. And like I got in the cold shower before I came here and I usually do that before like a talk or you know, something like that as well. But um, so norepinephrine release is one of the, the most consistent physiological responses. You can get that from 20 seconds at like 40 degree Fahrenheit water or two, <clears throat> excuse me, two minutes at um, 49 or 50 degree Fahrenheit water will, will release norepinephrine, norepinephrine twofold over baseline. Um, or you can be crazy and stay in like 50 degree water for an hour. Who does that? Um, and you'll go, get a five-fold increase. So um, why, we, why would you want norepinephrine? Well, it is a neurotransmitter. It does play a role in focus, attention. It regulates mood. Um, it helps with like anxiety. All those things are you know, important. So it's kind of, I personally like to time it around things like cold exposure. Um, also sort of benefits with respect to mitochondrial biogenesis. You can get in cold plunge and stay in there for 15 minutes and increase mitochondrial biogenesis markers in muscle tissue. So that's the growth of new mitochondria in your muscle tissue. That's great. Mitochondria are producing more energy. So it's associated with less muscle atrophy. It's associated, but you can get that from a high intensity workout too. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to necessarily do cold. Um, when should you do the cold? So I, I can tell you when not to do it. When not to do it would be after sort of a strength training or resistance training workout. How long is the window? So, mo so that's the good question. So I've come up with my own sort of window on this, and I can tell you the rationale behind that. But so here's the thing. There's been a couple of studies, and it's actually not all consistent. The first study that came out that was like the big, made the big deal, um, it was like, I don't know, 2015 or so when it came out or something like that. And the study did, it was a cold ice bath, and it was five minutes after a strength training workout where people the like the men went in and like put their leg or something like that in the in the ice bath for 15 minutes and this was right after the workout okay or they did passive recovery where they were actually on a stationary bike so the control group wasn't just sitting around they were actually in my opinion increasing hypertrophy by movement okay it's just that's clear i i think that's a flaw of the study and so the people that did the ice bath right after their work, their resistance training work at Howd still had hypertrophy, but they had less than the control group. Yeah, and so that was was like, oh, it's blunting gains, and so I was like, dive back then. I would dive into. I was trying to dive was into it understanding. leg or legs. I don't remember. Right, I was just wondering because it would be 
interesting if they compared the to leg. The neck, other leg, yeah. I don't, I don't remember. Um, it's been so long since I've read that study. But uh, so when you are, when you're doing exercise, when you're doing resistance training, you're obviously causing an inflammatory response, right? That's part of the stress. And there's a counter to that. There's a very potent anti-inflammatory response. And um, with the with the resistance training, you're actually damaging muscle, right? You're damaging the muscle. It's like a mechanical force activating all sorts of pathways. Well, turns out that immune cells have to get to that muscle and that plays a role in in the hypertrophy. But like this whole response, if you look at like some of the cytokines and IGF-1 that's involved in, in signaling and all that, it happens like it peaks like an hour after resistance training. And then after that, it kind of goes back down. And so the question is, when you're getting in the cold, you're causing basal restrict, restrict, constriction. So norepinephrine, I mentioned, is a uh, neurotransmitter. It's also a hormone. It's made in the periphery as well. And it's involved in vasoconstriction, which is the opposite of what heat does, vasodilation. So when you're vasoconstricting, you're cutting off the roads to get to your muscle, right? Like the growth factors, the immune cells, all those things can't get there, right? You're, you're stopping that, I think. This is what's happening. Uh, and so, you know, it's like, well, what if I just wait like an hour or two? Would I be safe? Possibly. Or maybe just, you know, do it at a few hours, like five hours. What's the rule you use? Five? Um, so I, I personally don't do as much, much cold exposure as I should do because I talk about it. I do it a lot more in the summer when it's hot. And but when I do do it, most of the time it's before something. I know it's like it's ridiculous, but it's the truth. Um, or I'll do it in the morning. Like, so I personally don't like to time it right after my heat exposure, mostly because blood pressure changes for me that are just freaky that I don't it's like. It's wild. Doing yeah. contrast therapy is very, yeah. very weird. It is. Yeah. I mean, some people like that, right? I, I enjoy it, but it's like a dizzy feeling. It's a dizzy. And I've had like even more extreme where it was like vertigo. And I yep. like, it I've, was, had, I've had to yeah. sit on the side and just. Yeah, exactly. Stare at the floor and hope that it goes away. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not too like fond of that feeling. So I like to separate them, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit. Um, although I think if I, if I wait like five to 10 minutes after I get out of the sauna, like, and just kind of at room temperature, just chill out for a minute, let my heart rate come down. Then I get in the cold. I don't have that response. So like waiting a little bit. So um, I think the rule of thumb for cold exposure is I think that neurotransmitter optimization, optimization like when do you want to use it to get that norepinephrine hit? Because it does help with focus and tension. It helps with mood, anxiety. And so like, you know, if you want to like, if you wake up in the morning first thing and do it, that's a great way to start the day. Hmm. Um, I like to wake up and get on my Peloton or do my workout, uh, but also just timing it around things. Like I said, I did a cold shower before I came here. Yep. Um, if I'm at home, I'll get into the cold plunge before something that, you know, is going to cause me more anxiety or just I need more focus and attention. So, so you mentioned uh, 20 seconds at 40 degrees is enough for the norepinephrine. But what about if we're looking for the full cascade, we're going to capture as much as we can most that is realistic for people to do how long, how frequently, how cold per week? So we talked about the norepinephrine and we talked a little bit about mitochondrial biogenesis, the growth of new mitochondria in skeletal muscle. And that was 15 minutes at 50 degrees, which if you can get to the three minute, three and a half minute mark at 50 degrees, you can get to 50. The rest of it's fine. Yeah. But um, there's another benefit we didn't talk about, which is actually making more mitochondria in your adipose tissue. And that's an adaptation that is a response to cold exposure because when you have more mitochondria in your fat you're you're basically making it's basically you're making more energy you burn more energy but you also release heat as a byproduct and so it's an adaptation the more you use the cold the it's called browning of fat and the reason for that is because when you look at a fat droplet under a microscope and there's more mitochondria in it it looks brown compared to white so so that's also something that happens and most of the studies looking at browning of fat in humans have not been done in getting into cold water they've been done in like humans walking around at 50 degree Fahrenheit or putting on a cold suit that's 50 degree Fahrenheit. I know it's like one of those things you like walk so around funny. with the air. Yeah. And, um, and so again, for those, I mean, it's, it's, it's anywhere between 15 minutes to an hour, you start to, you start to get that. So 15 minutes, I think is a good marker for, for a session, for a session, for 
you the whole shebang. Yep. Right. Like not just the norepinephrine, but the mitochondrial benefits. If you're also looking for browning of the fat yep. and you know the muscle. At what temperature? And so that would be like 50 degrees, 49 degrees Fahrenheit. If okay. you're if you can, and which is, it's. I mean, that's cold. Some that's, people go. That's. Pretty miserable. I mean, we're used to, again, it's so funny, like the bro version of me and my friends that do this in Austin, if we go to Kuya, uh, where I've said that you should go if, if you're coming through, um, it's 220 in the sauna, it's 37 degrees in the ice bath, and we're doing 20 and three, three times, like, but it seems like dialing that back in terms of intensity and increasing it in terms of frequency right. and duration is where we're actually going to maybe not even capture more gains, but reduce some of the negative uh, effects of us going hell for leather on. Yeah, I mean, you got to think about like you know the the fact that this you are stressing your body, right? Like you want uh, you want the stress to be good and great enough and ro you know robust enough, but you don't like there's a window, right? Like you don't want to like go outside that window where it's like damage. Yeah, but we're right? all one rep max pilled on everything so er all of the bros that go and do it go well look like when i went into the gym going to failure or doing drop sets or you know pushing myself until i want to throw up that worked that has to be the universal rule for all modalities of stimulus therefore i'll just do the sauna till i like want to pass out and i'll crawl out and that's got to be the best how long are you do you stay in the 230 uh and do you get down? Do you keep going down yeah, I to each step level? Step up and down. Yeah. It depends on whether my housemate's there. And we also watch stuff. So we'll put a speaker in there and like watch a little bit of like uh, an interview or YouTube or whatever. Um, usually about 15 to 20 minutes is like my real upper bound for that 231. That's a lot for it, that hot. Yeah. It was it was rough. It burns the inside of your nose. Like if you try and breathe in through your nose, yeah. it hurts. It hurts my nostrils to do that. Anyway, um, 15 minutes, 50 degrees. Uh, not done within five hours of hypertrophy training, let's just say it, to be safe. Right. Uh, also probably not done within a couple of hours of going to sleep because that's maybe going to cause some complications when it comes to getting your body core temperature right. Uh, you're talking about cold? Yes. I don't, no, I think I think it's a, like so, like it can help with sleep too, actually. Okay, doing cold so both hot well. and cold can... Both hot and cold can help with sleep. Because if you go hot, then it's going to bounce back and pull you into cold. It, it, it Yeah, your body does go. Like if you, you notice when you get out of the sauna, like yep. it doesn't take... It, I don't know how... It, it, it varies on each person, but after a little bit of time, all of a sudden you're really cold, right? Yes. You're like, yes. yeah. So um, I don't know that it... You know, I think people even do like hot and... I've done this, hot and cold, and it does really help with sleep doing both as well okay but it's also kind of a exhausting thing with your with your body which makes sense right i went, I went to this place in toronto called other ship have you heard of this it sounds yes yeah i have yeah my they're, friend, so they're yeah. cool it's similar to kuya in austin other ship do classes for heat and cold so they've got this 90 person sauna which is like a coliseum and it's this raked sort of seating and benches and it's huge this sauna thing at the front looks like a massive barbecue grill for the biggest party that you've ever seen and then they have coaches that guide you through the cold exposure as well so there's kind of like pts stood at the end of each of the cold tubs and they say what are you wanting to get out of the session today and they'll take you through different modalities one of the ones that they did with us which i really loved was 30 seconds in, 30 seconds out, three rounds of the cold. And while you were in there, you were moving both arms and legs and doing a little bit of toning, like vocal, like toning stuff. And uh, that was wild. I'd never done that before. We tend to just get in, sit in for two to three minutes, get out, go back in the sauna. But that was really interesting. The effect of doing that was was pretty cool. Yeah, doing a workout in there, because again, you're you're, it, it's like making your workout harder, right? It's like, because they're both sort of, to some degree, doing like, the, doing at least physiological response is kind of similar with respect to cardiovascular exercise. Well, there's also something about if you don't have an agitator in the cold tub, everyone's everyone's done this. Everyone knows that you get in and you sit and you're like, oh, I'm just going to wait for the film of warm water to kind of get around me. And if I really, really don't move, it'll be less painful. Yeah. But doing this is just, it's so miserable. It's like so miserable. All right, it's, uh, frequency, 15 minutes. Uh, 50 degrees how often i i don't know that there's an established frequency like there is with the sauna right this isn't 
like there's not large observational studies looking at people that are cold plunging. But I will tell you, so I talked to Dr. Lachunen about this. I said, well, what percentage of people in Finland, because these saunas are, the sauna studies are coming ground out of Finland. Z- Finland's ground zero. Yeah, like are doing, because they a lot of people will just, they'll, they'll do, they have like these public saunas, as it's called, and the community will get in there and then they go in like in the wintertime, they just go into the Baltic and jump in and it's cold. And I, I've been there, I've experienced it, I've seen it. So um, he was saying about 10% of people. I was actually thought it was going to be more than that, uh, but it's not. About 10% of the people are are doing are going doing contrast therapy. So they're going from hot to cold. So then you, you go, oh, well, because I wanted to know, I was like, are some of these benefits like from the contrast? And there's not a lot of research on it, you know. So the the question is like I don't I don't think that you can give a frequency like with absolute confidence four that, to seven times per week exactly blah, blah. yeah so it's more of a okay well are you looking for these browning of fat is that because it'll go away when you stop doing it so you have to keep it up um, and the more you do it it is kind of dose dependent so what do you try and do I told you that I don't do enough cold exposure unless it's the summer. What would you try and do? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, so I look, I feel great. I felt great this morning when I was doing my cold shower, right? Like I like to use it for that like mood booster. Acute sort of performance So it's enhancer. an acute performance enhancer, that neurotransmitter optimization thing. That's why, I, that's why I like to use it. And every time I do it, I'm like, why don't do I this do more. this more? I know why, because I'm doing the hit and the muscles and then I'm the mom and I like a yep. podcast and yep. that, you know, so it's like, that's, it's almost like, I think it's almost easier to just, at least if it's winter to just get into the cold shower because it's like less of like something about the cold plunge. You got to like lift it, the lid, lift the lid. You got to lift think the lid. It. You got to think about it. You're like, oh, it's the cold plunge and I got to get past that, that three, three and a half minute mark where, you know, you're burning and then you're not burning. So um, I think I think that I just le- would like to start using it on a more of a daily basis for the way it makes me feel. And that's why I like it mostly. It seems to me based on what you're saying here that although there is definitely a place for cold exposure and deliberate cold exposure has some effect that you don't capture with the sauna, if you were to make a pie chart of what's happening with heat and cold, a lot of it is coming from heat. And only a little bit of it is coming from cold. Yeah. When we're talking about a lot of these health outcomes with respect to cardiovascular disease and dementia and all cause mortality, all it is, it's all, but you know, again, the hot is mimicking moderate intensity exercise. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, the cold, I, I, I really just, it come, all comes back again to that. It makes you feel so good. You're getting that norepinephrine. Yeah. It does brown your fat. And like, look, browning of fat is a therapeutic target for many researchers that have been researching this now and for, you know, over a decade where it, it, it's, it's being looked at to help as a treatment for type 2 diabetes because you do improve metabolic health, like from browning of fat. But compare that to like exercise, diet, what you're eating. I don't know that it matters. I don't know that the cold even compares. Like, don't I don't even know that we should have been talking about the metabolic benefits of it when you're when there's like so much more bang for your buck. That's from, sprinkling on the top of the icing on the top of the cake. Yeah, cap. exactly. And it's like, okay, I'm making more mitochondria and my muscles, but I want to be doing hit and vigorous exercise for all the other benefits. And guess what? I get mitochondrial biogenesis from that, like pretty robustly. Is so, that um with the brown browning of the fat is that uh wrists in and clavicle in is that one of the cues that i've heard about this have you seen this stuff no i don't that's know. interesting so there'll be people screaming at us in the comments but i'm when i was at other ship when i've been to kuya uh when i've been with uh huberman uh, there's something to do with the wrist area kind of up to the bottom of the palm and something about the clavicle as well uh being a, an area which is particularly susceptible to um benefiting from cold exposure for this brown adipose Mm, tissue mm -hmm. thing. I heard this story that sounded true, which was during World War II, the Germans were trying to work out why their fighter pilots were dying so quickly when they were ejecting over the British Channel. Let's say that they'd run out of fuel or they'd been shot down or that the engine had failed for some reason or another. And the pilots were ejecting and they were finding them dying very shortly after the plane had gone down. So they had a lot of prisoners in one form or another that they were able to do these tests on. And what they found was that if the life jackets lifted the clavicle up out of the water, the survival time went through the roof. So there's something very important about this area of the body being under the water. 
And that is the converse reason, apparently, which is why your clavicle should be under when you're doing del deliberate cold exposure. Hmm. That's interesting. I know there's a, you know, when you're, when you get into cold water, particularly if you're not uh, adapted, like you're not deliberately doing it, there's a cold shock response. Right. And so I wonder, you know, and, and some of that plays a role in like mm. people actually having, you know, dying from, from getting in really cold water. I don't, I wonder if there's a connection there between the cold shock response. Uh, yes. And, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because less of them is under the water. When it comes to exercise, what is your framework for designing an exercise routine? Um, well, so for me, I personally get very motivated when I understand how things work and, and look at data and see outcomes. And I think, okay, well, I need to, you know, get my routine around this, whatever, you know, is, is, is the data. Um, and so I have been pretty convinced that I've always been like a runner. I've always been endurance more of an endurance junkie i'm not an athlete like i've done like one marathon in my entire life you know i'm not out there clocking those kinds of miles but i do enjoy going for runs and i enjoy um that sort of endurance exercise so um for me that was always what i might go to and less focusing on resistance training as we've talked about is hugely important for muscle mass but um the question is well how hard do I need to go on the, you know, on the endurance? So does it need to be more of a vigorous exercise workout or moderate intensity, lower intensity? Is anything better than nothing? Yes. I think at the end of the day, like the most important thing is habit. Like what are you going to consistently do, right? Like you're going to consistently do some sort of physical activity and it needs to be that, like whatever it is that you will do. Otherwise, like you can talk about what's the best, but if you won't do it, uh, it doesn't matter, right? So, um, I try to get a lot of vigorous intensity exercise in. So that would be 80% max heart rate. And um, the reason for that is because I've been pretty convinced that if you are not an athlete doing more than 10 hours a week or 10 or more, right, of, you know, endurance training. So if you're, if you're not that person, um, I think that it's more beneficial, the data suggests it's more beneficial to engage the majority of the time in more vigorous intensity exercise versus what's zone two training, right? So like a lower intensity or I guess it's more moderate intensity, uh, the talk test kind of exercise, right? Where you're breathy, but you can still have a conversation, which I do like doing those as well, particularly when I'm having a conversation with someone on a run. It's nice. I enjoy it. But um, I do also go harder. Um, I do a lot of high intensity interval training. And um, I think that the there's there's evidence for that. Uh, if you are going harder and you're getting that heart rate up to 80% max heart rate, you're increasing that lactate. And we've talked about this, that, you know, that in itself is beneficial. Um, it's beneficial for the brain. And I think that's one reason I'm particularly motivated because I'm very interested in brain health. And so lactate has been shown, lactate is consumed by the brain during physical activity. This has been shown in humans and it fuels basically your normal function while you're exercising is so your brain is working harder while you're exercising just like your heart and your muscles your brain is working harder too and lactate is feeling that and you're 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 basically increasing norepinephrine and serotonin from that lactate so lactate itself is actually it, it can be used as an energy source a very utilizable energy source much like beta hydroxybutyrate which is a ketone body that you make when you're either fasting or on a ketogenic diet um, it's very similar. And so lactate increases those neurotransmitters. It also increases that brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is beneficial for growing new neurons. It's beneficial for neuroplasticity, for basically making you feel better, making you smarter, staving off neurodegenerative disease. Like there's, you want BDNF, like that's what you want. And so, and again, this is all evidence-based studies that have been shown in humans showing that the higher intensity, the more intense the workout, the more vigorous, the more lactate and lactate is signaling to increase that. It's the way that your muscles communicate with other organs. Like it's it's increasing lactate and lactate is going to other, it's being shuttled to other organs and it's signaling to them to do these beneficial things. It's called the lactate shuttle. It's also being shuttled back into your muscle and doing things like increasing glucose uptake. We, we talked about that as well. So the lactate itself is only going to come when you're cranking up the intensity, mm. when you're working hard enough that you can't get enough oxygen to your muscles, you know, to, to basically produce energy. 
So that's sort of the, the I'm actually trying to make more lactate. And the lactate increase doesn't last long. It's pretty transient, like 20 minutes or so, you'll be back to your baseline after a pretty intense workout. So um, there's data not only showing that it's beneficial for the brain and be brain, brain-derived neurotrophic factor and these neurotransmitters is talking about, but also um, lactate itself is used by neurons. So the lactate that's going into your brain, it's, it's it transported across the blood-brain barrier. It's used by neurons as an energy source. And in fact, our neurons prefer lactate. So our astrocytes, which is a supporting cell in our brain, they make a lot of lactate because they actually are what's called glycolytic. They use glucose without their mitochondria as energy and they shuttle the lactate out and neurons take it up. And so neurons like to use lactate because they use they they it, they can use lactate as an energy source without um, using as much much energy as they do with glucose. So it takes more energy to use glucose to make energy than it does lactate, if that well, makes sense. It's so funny, you know, even when you were in school, people would learn about the lactate threshold and they'd know that that was the reason that your muscles burn when you're doing cross-country running and you're 13 years old or whatever. And it's almost like the enemy in some ways. It's the thing that hurts. I don't want it. I don't like that. And now you're telling me that it might actually be super useful super it's 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 definitely the thing that you want um it's 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 just it's hugely beneficial for the brain you know again it's it's also beneficial for the blood brain barrier it's increasing vegf which is a growth factor that helps you grow new blood vessels and like repair blood vessels at your blood brain barrier so it doesn't break down which happens with age so it is and i was talking about the neurons using it um there's there's evidence that when so when your neurons use lactate they spare glucose. They don't need glucose because they're using lactate for energy, right? And what happens is called the glucose sparing effect. And what that means is glucose can be used for other things. And what it's used for is producing, it's a pre, it makes a precursor for glutathione, which is the major antioxidant in the brain. And so um, there's actually, a, there's, there's research out there looking at giving people lactate infusions <laughs> that have TBI. What does that feel like? <laughs> Well, it's like sodium lactate, so it feels like, you know, saline, but... Oh, okay. Yeah. So so people that have a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, they have massive, like, injury in their brain, right? And um, they need glutathione. It's a very potent antioxidant. But their glucose is being used up to make energy. I mean, it's not... There's nothing there to make the glutathione. And so there's these studies that have shown that the sodium lactate infusions is has a beneficial effect with TBI because it... Again, I think this is the mechanism that's happening. One of many is it's helping with the glucose sparing. So glucose is used to make more antioxidant in your brain. So that on top of it's also making BDNF, brain drive wow. neurotrophic factor. Okay. So I think that there'll be a lot of people listening who fall into one of two camps. Almost everyone listening will be training in some way or another, right? This is an audience of jack people. But one will skew toward the bodybuilding style training. It'll probably be a three to five day split, like push pull legs or maybe a body part split or something like that. Uh, and those people will likely be trying to hit, you know, the six to 10,000 steps per day. So they'll be focused very much on the resistance training. There'll be another camp of people who are like heavy on zone two. There'll be the runners, there'll be the cyclists. Maybe there'll be some hybrid training people that are in there, but even the hybrid training guys are going to just be doing like either camp one or camp two what you're saying is that there is third camp, which is this high intensity, vigorous exercise, and that that may be the most important one of all. So I think that uh, if we're talking about the the camp with the zone two, and if we're if we're talking about athletes more, I mean these are people that are clocking a lot of miles, right? No, just normal people. Oh, normal okay. People. So these are like committed exercisers doing maybe yeah. you know four two to four hours a week of exercise. Yeah. They'll do a park run and they'll like you know they'll 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 keep on top of their runs throughout the week or whatever. Yeah, I think that if that's so again going back to like. If that's what they're going to do, every, it's, running is beneficial. Like the, you're also going to get a lot of benefits from just doing Zoom too, right? Like if, but you know, there's. I think that if you can step it up to being a little bit more vigorous, if you can still do that and habitually do it, hmm. um, incorporate some high intensity interval training in there as well. Uh, I do think it's very beneficial, and you know, it's also beneficial for the VO2 max improvements. Like there's been studies that have been done looking at people that are actually meeting the requirements for um, aerobic exercise per week. So it's like two and a half hours a week. And 
even if they're meeting those like doing moderate intensity exercise, there's like 40% of those people will not improve their VO2 max. Like they're called non-responders. It's not really known why they don't respond, but it's thought because, you know, improvements in in your cardiorespiratory fitness as measured by VO2 max, it, it's an adaptation. And in, in order to have that adaptation, like a stronger stressor will produce a little bit more of a robust adaptation. And so there are studies that have identified like people that don't respond, if they then engage in more high intensity training, they can get those VO2 max improvements. And that's 40% of people that would do, be doing your zone two plus resistance training style stuff that it's, doesn't peak up. I mean, Petra Tia told me that VO2 max is the single most important metric when looking at someone's longevity. How much truth do you think is in that? I, I think that absolutely he's right. I think VO2 max is one of the single. And and the, and the thing I love about it is that it's something that you can measure. It's a biomarker. I think it's one of the most important things. Absolutely. And there's, you know, there's, there's some evidence that like doing doing this vigorous exercise is important, but it has to be like a longer interval type of exercise. So, you know, at least one minute, that would be sort of the minimum, but like better if you can get to four minutes. So there's something called the Norwegian four by four protocol. And that's four minutes at the highest intensity that you can maintain for that entire four minutes, mm. followed by three mi minute recovery of like light, light exercise. I mean, you want your heart rate to come down so that you could do it again four times, right? So Sounds the Norwegian- miserable. Sounds yes. absolutely miserable. The Norwegian four by four. Um, and, you know, there's there was a study and I like, I like, this is one of the studies that inspired me. And this is, this was a study out of uh, UT Southwest in Dallas. And um, the study took 50 year olds that were healthy, but they were not physically active. So they didn't have like type two diabetes and all that, but they weren't active. They're also detrained. Exactly. They're detrained. And they put them on a pretty intensive training protocol for two years. Okay, two years. It was a two-year intervention. And it was a progressive protocol. So obviously, when you have an untrained person, you don't just write out the bat, Norwegian 4 by 4 day one. No, that's not going to happen. So <laughs> it took them six months to kind of work up their, their, their training, right, their endurance. And by the time they got to their six-month mark, they were doing about, you know, four hours a week of what's called maximal intensity exercise. So this is vigorous. This is this is four hours a week of maximal intensity. Yeah. Wow. So they were doing so they were basically doing it was like is as, as high as you can maintain, you know, a in, vigorous intensity workout for 30 minutes, basically. So they're doing these 30 minute workouts where you're doing like 75, 80 percent max heart rate for 30 minutes. OK, so I but mean, they're doing that eight times a week. Yeah. I mean, so no, they're also doing, they're doing other things as well. So they're doing, it's not, when I say four hours a week, they're exercising four hours a week. Oh, they're right. also I doing. Thought you they were doing four hours of this sorry. Norwegian no, 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 four no. by four. No, no, thing. no, 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 no. They were doing exercise four hours a week. Okay. Um, but they were doing, um, a majority of that was maximal intensity exercise. So a lot of that was, they were doing like 30 minute sessions of okay. this. Right. And I think they were probably doing like one and a half to two hours of that. Yep. And then they were also doing some strength training. And then they were doing the Norwegian four by four. So it was kind of a, a nice sort of balanced. And then the control group was doing this sort of, I say strength training, but it was more, I guess, body weight, you know, kind of stuff. Um, the control group was doing that. So it was a type of sort of body weight training, but it wasn't high intensity. Like it wasn't like the the CrossFit kind of stuff that you could do. It was it was more like lower stretching kind of stuff, maybe yoga-ish kind of thing. And um, so so after two years, these people like the, the cardiac structure. So as we age, our heart gets smaller and it gets stiffer. And this happens. It's like part of aging um, that results in a lot of things. So cardiovascular disease risk goes up, but also like your exercise performance and capacity goes down. So so after that two years of, you know, doing this pretty vigorous intensity exercise protocol, they're, um, the people, the 50-year-olds, they reversed their cardiac structure aging by 20 years. So their hearts were looking more like 30-year-old hearts versus 50-year-old hearts. And this is after two years of doing this. And to me, it was so motivating to go, wow, these 50-year-olds can do this. Like these were untrained people who don't usually work out. And by the end of this two years, I mean, they were like getting at it. 
Um, and so I've, you know, kind of stepped up my my game a bit. Also, like I've got a coach coming and I'm working with um, two, two days a week and to do I'm doing a lot of uh, it's like a resistance training, but like kind of interval as well. Mm-hmm. So I'm getting the high heart rate and and that interval. Training. So funny to see Peter Tier and yourself kind of converge on this new it's not, it's not as if it's new, but it was definitely something that I wasn't hearing about four years ago. I wasn't hearing people talk about this. Everything was zone two. It was, you know, like go slow to go fast or whatever the tagline is. And um, one of the problems with zone two is that you need quite a high duration right. like by design because, you know, 45 minutes or an hour multiple times per week, which is actually difficult. So lots of benefits of improving VO2 max. What are take us through the Norwegian four by four again. And then what else is in there? If there was a protocol or a number of protocols you were going to design, here's a program that you can take away today into your gym and do that will help to improve your VO2 max. What would you tell people? I would say the Norwegian four by four is by far the best. And you're going to get the, for the people that are really um, determined and committed, that would be it. That would be the four minutes of the exercise intensity as hard as you can go and maintain it for that entire four minutes. So Just obviously- Just dig into that. What, what do you mean? As hard as you can go and maintain it. What does that mean? It means you don't want to go like all out, like like 95% of your, your max heart rate um, because then you can only last for like a minute you know, and so, so then you're going to go down, you're going to, you're going to slow down. Right. So what it means is like, you want to go, you know, it it might, for some people it might be like 75% max heart rate. Right. So some people might be 80%, but you want to go as hard as you can for the four minutes uh, without like really slowing down. So you kind of have to pace yourself a little bit, Mm -hmm. but you don't want to go too slow. Right. Like you, you definitely can't be talking. Like you should not be able to talk for sure when you're doing it. So it's hard enough that you just absolutely can't talk, but it's not all out. So four minutes, four minutes, and then three minutes of totally light. Like you're going all the way. This is like, you know, you're, you're like back to like zone one, if you want (laughs) to call it something. If your heart can come, come down. If your heart can come down. (laughs) Yeah. And you're doing that for three minutes because you want to give your, you want to recover so that you can do it again. And it, and you repeat it. It's, it's a four, it's a four time protocol. So you do it once and then you repeat it three times, or you just call it the four by four. I think that's probably one of the, the best protocols to improve VO2 max. Now, uh, Dr. Martin Gabala, um, I've had him on my podcast. He's a real expert on these high intensity interval training protocols. He does a lot of research on it at McMaster University um, in Ontario, Canada. And he also says you there, you know, there are, there's evidence that a one minute protocol. So like just even doing like an interval, like one minute interval and then doing that, like, you know, a few times also can improve VO2 max. So that's a little easier. And also it's easier. Like I like I, I do one minute intervals. Um, I'm trying to now incorporate the four by four into my routine, um, which is coaches help with that. So um, but it, I imagine it is, it's a motivation thing, which is probably one of the biggest hurdles to get over that just <clears throat> If you've got any program in front of you that isn't the Norwegian four by four for the day, you go, ah, maybe it's back and biceps. Or, ah, maybe I'll just go for a little jog. It's like manana, manana, manana. Yeah, it is. It, but again, like I said, you do have to do, you try to make it consistent. So uh, frequency per week. Well, the Norwegian four by four would be like one time a week. Oh, okay. And that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the, the, that's dose. the hard day. That's less, that's, that's less the miserable. hard day. It is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is there any benefit to going twice per week? Probably, yeah. <laughs> but it have been so much better but if these, you'd said, but these oh, 50 no, year olds, no, actually, yeah, yeah, these 50 year olds did it one time a week for two years and they reversed their cardiac structure aging by 20 years. Um, of course, they were they were also doing other vigorous intensity exercise. It wasn't the torturous Norwegian 4x4. Four four, yep. You know, like. So d- if Norwegian 4x4 four four is gold standard at the moment for improving VO2 max. What would be some examples of other vigorous exercise uh, uh, workouts? What else is in that bucket? Well, people can do what they enjoy doing. So you can go for a run. Like I often go for a run and, you know, I'm doing 75, 80% my max heart rate. Uh, usually it's like a 20 minute run that I do that, you know, so like as, as, as intense as you can maintain for 20 minutes, like that's what you want to do. You want to kind of get that, you get a feeling for that. 
Um, so if you like runs, because there's a lot of benefits to running, you're out in nature. Well, I guess some people do it on a treadmill. I'm not so big on treadmills. Like I, I'll do them like when I go to a gym or something traveling, but I like running out in nature. I think there's, it's just, it's, there's lots of benefits to doing that. Um, some people like to get on their bike and cycle. So like you can just get on your bike and do a 20 to 30 minute, uh, 75, 80% max heart rate cycle, right? So what we're aiming for here is 75 to 80% max heart rate for around about 20 minute exposure. You can, or you can do, you could do like a high intensity interval training. So, um, so high intensity interval training would be, you're going to, you're going to go more than 85, 80%, right? You might go, you're going to do like more of like a sub maximal, perhaps, uh, perhaps even a maximal interval so you can go up to 90 95 percent max heart rate so that would be i mean obviously you can only maintain that for like so long right some people might be 30 second pushes yeah, like or a tabata a style thing perhaps. tabata i do a lot of tabatas as well um oftentimes i like to do something every day um most days of the week and it's funny i kind of adopted this this routine when i was i was kind of trying to uh, do a little bit like Joe Rogan's Sober October, but it was like every day October, I was trying to work out every day. And I noticed, I was like, I could do this. I'm doing it for like one month. And I don't, I wasn't going as hard as like the those guys doing the Sober October where they were like competition. It was like, they were just- Air bike um, in the but sauna. But like, if you do something, every, do something every day. So sometimes I'll do like a 10 minute Tabata where I get on there and I just go hard for 10 minutes. It's 20, you know, it's most of the time I'll do a 45 second on, um, 15 second off. So it's a three to one ratio. I really like that one, but sometimes I'll do 20 second on, 10, uh, 10 second off. So okay. it's like, I do both, but like even just 10 minutes, again, I time it around like, like, like I got, I'm going to go do work. I'm going to, I want to feel motivated. I want to feel better. I want to be more focused and on my game. And I just get on there for the bike for 10 minutes and do it. Um, you know, there's there's studies out there, um, these sort of exercise snacks. Now, 10 minutes is longer than an exercise snack. But there's studies out there where uh, people are wearing these like wearable devices, right? And so you can track their their heart rate and you can track how, how their heart rate's going up. And so there's large, large studies. They're called the Vigorous Intensity Lifestyle Activity. And um, most people are taking advantage of everyday life. Like they're, they have stairs every day to work. They sprint up them. They don't walk up them. They sprint. They get their heart rate up to like 75% max heart rate, 80% max heart rate. They're, they're, they're getting intense. And people that do this anywhere between one to three minutes a day, um, I mean, these these guys have like a 50% lower cancer-related mortality, cardiovascular-related mortality. And this was even true for people that identified themselves as non-exercisers. So they aren't, these are people that are not going to the gym or doing other like tennis or whatever. They don't have leisure time, physical activity. So the benefits were also in people that identified as non-exercisers. So my point is that the vigorous intensity, these like even short bursts of it just consistently like every day a little bit like they do add up there's additive effects and they make a difference so that's also i think really something that's very encouraging because some people oh i gotta go and work out for 30 it's like it, it you need that motivation right mm -hmm. like some people don't have that motivation and so um it's a lot easier to just get up and do something for two minutes it's hard but you can do it and you can do it at your house right? what apart from running up and down the stairs what are some other ways that people can incorporate exercise snacks to take advantage of this? Body weight squats um, are a great one. So you just you're just you know doing your squats and you do it for a minute and then rest for whatever fifteen seconds and then do another minute. I mean those are hard and they get your heart rate up. So you can do that for like three minutes. Uh, that's a really good one. And then you're going to be really sore if you're not used to it. But and then there's the high knees. So you do high knees. Um, I mean you could do chair squats. You could do plank, um, the not planks, the uh, burpees, those burpees. So you do like the the plank thing, and then you come up and jump, and like those are all I think really great examples of just like easy ways to do exercise snacks, like even at your desk, and um, just even breaking up. We're, we're talking about improving cognition, improving mood. Breaking up your workday with those, like it makes a difference on your mood, on your cognition. Like it it, it helps. You're getting blood flow immediately to your brain. So um, yeah, you were talking. You were telling me about um, the need for people to break up their sedentary time. That there's some very specific uh, risks that people can encounter if they're too sedentary for too long, too frequently. What's happening there? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so I never identified myself as sedentary because I've always done something like running or jumping rope or something like going to the gym. Something I'm where I'm physically active. So it's like, oh, I'm in the 
physically active group. I'm not sedentary. Well, it turns out um, being sedentary is like what we've been for the past couple of hours. We've been sitting here. That is sedentary. So even when you're, even if you, you know, go to the gym or you go for runs, when you are sitting at your desk for a period of hours, you are sedentary. And sedentary, being sedentary itself is an independent risk factor for disease like cancer. So now do I think the marathon runner that, you know, also has a, you know, desk job where they sit at their desk for eight hours is going to come down with cancer? Probably not because they're 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 really putting a lot of effort in and they're they're physically active. But um I certainly am not the athlete and I am a committed exerciser, right? So I I'm putting in anywhere between, you know, two to five hours of, you know, exercise in a week, depending on the week, right? So um for me, like I spent a lot of time sitting. I spent a lot of time sitting. And so that to me was like a big thing where it's like, oh, that's an independent risk factor for breast cancer, um, which, you know, a, a woman's breast cancer risk and just lifetime risk is one in eight. It's incredibly high. And of course, there, of course there's lifestyle factors that can sort of increase or decrease that. Um, and just sed sedentaryism is a independent risk factor for that. So again, it's it's really, and it's so easy. So I've, I have started incorporating exercise snacks. Um, I'll get up and I'll start doing some some body weight squats. I think that's my, my go-to. I also like doing um, burpees. I've been doing some burpees and high knees I'll do. Um, Every hour? Um, I think every couple of hours. I've also been starting to time them around my meals. Um, so that's that's another thing. I think being aware of the postprandial glucose response and how it affects my my cognitive function, my mood, uh, and also just knowing that it's healthier. And it's so easy to do. Like just do like two or three minutes of pre food. You can do it pre or post food, both. Trying to do burpees post food might be difficult. You can do it up to like an hour after. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so one of the things that Dr. Stu McGill, number one back pain specialist on the planet, taught me about forever ago, and then Mark Bell also popularized this 10-minute walk, 15-minute walk post-eating because insulin sensitivity, because of helping to re-adjust um, glucose levels within the blood, uh, also the muscles of the hips uh, and the arms cross across the stomach. So it actually helps with digestion of food a little bit as well. Like if you've had a really big meal and all you want to do is lie down, actually probably one of the best things that you can do to make yourself feel better is maybe go for a, a walk. What would you say here? We've got the, the post-meal walking crowd and the post-meal burpees crowd. Mm -hmm. Like, is there something that they're, that you're missing from one of those or are you happy with either? Um, well, I don't know about the whole... <sighs> arms movement, aiding and yep. digestion thing, all of that. Um, I do know that the more vigorous intensity when you're actually going to start that feeling that burn, right? When you start to when you start to get up to that, okay, I'm making some lactate, that's what's actually increasing the the transporters, glucose transporters, gluc they're called glute four. Hmm. They're in your muscle and they have to like move their way up to the top. And lactate is what signals them to do that. So when I'm just thinking about the glucose and improving blood glucose levels, vigorous is better. Um, you're and actually fact, chasing that burn. You're chasing the burn. And there's been studies that have that have compared walkers to interval walkers. So these are people that are just walking versus the walk. Pick up the pace while they're walking. Walk slower. Pick up the pace while they're walking. Now, they're not running, but they're just they're interval walking. And it's been shown that interval walking improves a variety of metabolic parameters more than just walking. And again, it, it makes sense because when you're picking up the pace, you're 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 working harder, you're making lactate, and that's one of the big signals for these glucose transporters to come up to the top of the muscle and let the glucose in. Mm. So uh, I do think from a mechanistic understanding that, and also data showing walking versus interval walking. Interval walking is better when you can when you can pick up the pace when you can go a little bit more intense. It's better. All right. What about becoming muscled for longevity? So that's I'm I'm working on. You probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not all jacked up, but I'm that's that's my that's been my new goal. Um, particularly of of late, but for like the past year, um, I've become more aware of it. I've spent more time focusing on it. I now have a coach um, who's great and coming to work with me to focus on that because I feel. You know, I'll tell you when it really hit me. Um, I had, I had someone on the podcast, Mark, Dr. Mark Madsen, and he, I have admired his work for years. He's a, he's like the intermittent fasting 
King. Like he's, I, I've known him as research since he was in my twenties, right? Like he's also done a lot of work on hormesis, and I, you know, I've just I followed his work for so much of my scientific career. So um, it was very cool to have him on the podcast and talk to him. And uh, we were talking all about everything under the sun with respect to fasting and hormesis, and and we started talking about uh, training. And he he has been a you know track you know runner forever, big big endurance athlete, my, my, you know mountain biking everything. And he told me he said you know the one thing that I really reg- regret um, in my life is that I didn't spend more time building muscle mass because he had an accident, he had a mountain biking accident, and you know basically couldn't walk around and use his muscles for quite a period of time. And he said it it really hit him hard. And so um, that was my first kind of like, oh, wow, like that's like I'm I've always focused on endurance. I never thought I really needed to focus much on muscle. I'm not a bro. Like I didn't have that incentive to like, you know, build the muscle. And I knew it was important, but uh, I didn't really I didn't dive in deep enough and and convince myself that it was as important. So um, that was the first sort of eye opener for me. And then I had Stuart Phillips on who does a lot of research on resistance training. He's the one that like I helped, you know, identify that the the RDA for protein intake is uh, likely too low. Um, and he he has a really good way of explaining, you know, muscle mass and this what's called a disability threshold, which is what I think everyone that has an older parent or grandparent has seen in in action where you're they get older and they experience that you know take where they're they're out for whatever a couple of weeks and then all of a sudden of course they can't gain their muscle back and then it happens again and then again and then all of a sudden it's just downhill and they can't walk they you know and and the trajectory just plummets um and you know it's it's just not good so in order to sort of you know not let that disability threshold be so devastating you really have to build up your muscle mass earlier in life it actually it's never too late but if you can do it earlier in life it's better so um training wise like i now am i'm i'm i used to just do i mean really it was like 30 minutes a week or so of like resistance training you know where i'm just doing dumbbells or something and now i'm doing two hours a week maybe a little bit more so that is a new focus and I'm working with the coach because I've noticed I do, I'm much more likely to injure myself when I'm just like doing it myself and I don't really know what I'm doing and I'm following like a Peloton class or something. So now I'm working with a coach who's um, really great and I just, I'm, I was so sore just after the first training session. I was like, I thought I was fit, you know, mm. and here I am like just little tendons and muscle, like I just didn't even know were there. So uh, now I'm I'm really trying to get I think minimum like two hours a week of some sort of resistance training where I'm working uh, a lot of my muscles, not just you know my biceps or my triceps. So if investing in muscle mass is like contributing to a retirement fund that you can then withdraw from right. in later life, what is the age where it starts to become more difficult, and then after what age is it basically impossible to gain muscle mass? So there's muscle mass and there's muscle strength. And I've everything that I know I've learned from the experts like Dr. Stuart Phillips, like Dr. Brad Schoenfeld and reading their work and um, their publications. So, um, you know, muscle mass peak around 20 to 30. And then after that, you start to lose about 8% per decade until you get to 70. It's 12% per decade. But strength decreases are even greater than that. So, um, you know, we we talk a lot about muscle mass and that's important, but but strength is important, right? Like you want to be able to get up and out of a chair. Like it it makes a difference on your quality of life, like being able to be independent and function independently. And so that's where um, there's hope, especially because so we're talking about muscle mass gains. Well, it's like. So what happens when you reach reach the age of 50? It's, you know, you're not, your, your anabolic resistance is starting to kick in, right? You're not being as sensitive to the protein intake. You really have to rely more on, on the, the mechanical force, you know, of, of stimulating muscle protein synthesis as the form of increasing muscle mass and hypertrophy. So um, is there a, a time when you won't gain any muscle? I think you'll continue to gain it. It just won't be as much, right? You're really battling atrophy at that point too. So you know, the more you can contribute earlier, the more you'll have to pull from. But I do think the strengths, the gains in strength are what is really good because 
um, at least there's studies showing in older adults, even ones that haven't really worked out much, if they start a, a, a resistance training program, they can counter the atrophy losses and they can gain and they can like regain strength, like years that they've lost. So you can really gain your strength gains can be really good even in old age. And I think yeah, that's, that's important. Obviously one of the things that people might be thinking, I'm 42. Like, does that mean that it's too late basically for me, me to start gaining muscle or gaining strength? Or is it, is it, am I a lost cause at this age? No, <laughs> not at all. No, not 42. I mean, it's going to get more challenging when you're 72. Uh, but even then, you're going to gain strength. I mean, there's studies showing that for sure. Uh, you know, it, muscle mass gains won't be as good, but you will you will be countering that that atrophy. You know, it, it's it's not like it's not beneficial. Do people need to lift heavy? Well, that's that's the that's the the golden question that first to Phillips he showed that years ago. Um, that people, he, he did an untrained people first. So he, he showed that untrained men, um, could gain just as much muscle mass and strength, uh, lifting lighter weights as people, as the men gain, uh, lifting heavy weights, as long as they put in the effort. So the volume and effort has to be high. Mm. So you have to like, you'll probably do a longer duration, It'll be more, you'll, you'll be doing, you know, more, more effort, but you can gain as much muscle mass and strength if you're doing lighter weights, as long as you're putting in that effort. Um, and then Brad Schoenfeld came in after because he was like, ah, oh, Stu, that was, that was untrained men. Come on. And he then did it in trained men. And lo and behold, guess what? Same data, same results. So uh, the trained men also could gain as much muscle mass and strength by mm. lifting lower doing lower weights uh, as long as the effort is that's the key effort right you have to put in enough you have to be fatigued if you're Do you know not who fatigued. dr mike isretel is no i don't professor of exercise science at lehman college um probably i think the best guy for evidence based hypertrophy training on the internet at all at the moment i had him on the show last week and um <clears throat> He's just so, I would, you really, really need to connect with him because the guy's so phenomenal. He's also jacked out of his mind, right? right? So he like walks the talk. Uh, but he came on and he was explaining about the, the typical sort of bro science rep range, which was eight to 14, any more than 14, and it's completely pointless. His rule, or at least what the evidence seems to show, is that anything over six and below 30, as long as when you finish, you are looking at one to two, uh, one to three RIR, reps in reserve. So that's what you're talking about here. He's uh, Brad Schoenfeld is one of the guys that he respects the most in the industry as well. And um, th the point is that you can get yourself to 28. And if you're like, I could do three more, maybe. That's good. Now, one of the disadvantages that you have of doing that is obviously your session length is going to be longer. Uh, but one of the advantages that you have is that your injury risk is going to be lower. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, that was fascinating to me as someone who's spent his entire life like allergic to going over 16 reps. Like, no, 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 that's just cardio. Like, that's just, you know, that's just lame. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, a couple of the other things that he taught me that I thought were fascinating, he's a huge proponent of tempo. So it seems like the tempo of the movement is super crucial. The entire duration of the rep should not be less than two seconds. So you could get away with one second up and one second down. But it's very important to control the eccentric portion of the movement. Most of the muscle growth comes in the eccentric portion of the movement. The long stretch that you get at the very end range of the movement as well seems to be particularly where muscle growth is discriminated toward. So what you want to try and do is do exercises which incorporate that stretch. For instance, if you see um, people that do wide grip lat pull downs, you get to this position and you're like, well, my lats aren't actually all that stretched. Whereas if you go a little bit more narrow, you go overhand uh, pull-ups or one of his favorites, which is this like a single arm wrap around uh, lat pull across. So if you can imagine that you've got a, a cable machine over there and you're actually getting into this really super stretched position and you're pulling right back around and you're feeling that. that. Um, but yeah, for him, the, the key things that I took away from that was one to three reps in reserve. Uh, tempo seems to be just a great way again to reduce down the load because you could still get to three reps in reserve on 
10 reps, but because you've been doing tempo, it's so much harder. So again, you have all of these different things that you can use to manipulate the difficulty and the amount of reps that you need to go through. Uh, and just a little pause at, at extension in whatever it is. The bottom of a squat is going to mean, again, that you don't need to use quite so much weight. It's going to put you into that, uh, the muscle stretched position, which is where most of the hypertrophy occurs. And just I think a two countdown on whatever it is that you're doing just seems to be the smartest way to do it. It's going to reduce injury risk. It's going to mean you don't need to use as much weight. It's going to maximize that uh, time under tension uh, that we're talking about. And it's going to mean that if you do do a little pause at the bottom and then get it back up, it's fine. So that's now for me, all of my training, my entire training protocol is built around that type of tempo, rep range, uh, and loading with the stretch at the bottom. So it was, it was so simple. It was great to hear. Really, really good. Yeah, that's a really great, I mean, easy to follow kind of protocol. I mean, for sure. And I, I do remember um, Dr. Brad Schoenfeld talking about the some of the same things with the eccentric movement and mm. the stretching of it and all that, like being really important for hypertrophy. And of course, my my new coach who knows everything, she's like on top of all of it. So Pointing at you, telling you. <laughs> what about training when you're tired? A lot of the time people don't get as much sleep as they want or they're a little bit more stressed or whatever. And they think, I'm tired. Should I train? Yes. If I train, I make myself more tired. That might be dangerous or whatever. What What do you think? Well, yeah, absolutely. That's the that's the time where you should train most. I mean, and we were kind of talking about this, right? So, you know, there's studies showing that if you don't get enough sleep, you can have a higher all cause mortality than someone who gets enough sleep, unless you're physically active. Physical activity blunts some of those negative effects of not getting enough sleep. So you're tired. You should you should go get at it. And also, guess what happens? You don't feel more tired. You feel like, especially if you're going to go do like a hit workout, you feel invigorated. You feel better. You're increasing blood flow to the brain. That's what you need, right? You're lowering inflammation. Inflammation is what's making you tired. Inflammation is what's giving you that that tired feeling. And so exercise is, is the, the counter to that, right? Exercise is one of the most robust ways you can have an anti-inflammatory response because your body is naturally, you know, there's one thing, I mean, we talked about taking omega-3s. I mean, there's ways to reduce inflammation by, by, by taking certain phytochemicals or omega-3s, but exercise is forcing your body to use all of its genetic pathways to counter that inflammation. And it does it for a long time. It's not just a as quick as you metabolize it, how long is it in your blood? What's the half-life of the compound deal? This is like days after, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the little bit of stress that you're putting on your body, that anti-inflammatory effect is so much greater that it counters the stresses of life, of everything, of metabolism, of just you know, thinking and breathing. So I think that exercising when you're tired, you should be motivated and know that you're actually, you're going to feel better. It's going to, you're going to, you're going to be less tired after, like you really are, especially if you don't go for like a five hour run. I mean, like, let's like, you know. There's an I, upper bound. Yeah. Well, yeah. I suppose as well, you know, one of the things when you're tired, your injury risk does go up your ability to do fine control motor movement and stuff like that. So if you're going to go and get that session, but you've only had five hours sleep because the kids woke up at 4 a.m. this morning and it's been a nightmare or you just got back from a flight or whatever, like don't try and max out yeah. today, right? It's not it's not 3RM deadlift day. It's I go in and I try and work hard, but not kill myself day. Right. You either, I mean, if it's, you know, it's always easier to like, I, I, like I said, if you could just do like a hit session, that's great. Or just do, you know, do a high intensity sort of body weight exercise workout, right? You do some push ups, you do some, pull, you know, some pull ups and then some squats or whatever, you know, or lift lighter, like you were saying, where you're not, you're not gonna. The other thing is, how, like the story that you tell yourself about being the sort of person that maybe didn't have an ideal night's sleep, but still went and got after it. And this is totally separate to the physiological effect. Yeah, I suppose the endorphins of the actual session will help with this. But like, I overcame a difficult thing today. Like that story that you tell yourself is so powerful and it, it helps to kind of reinforce this positive self-image of being someone who happens to life as opposed to life happens to them. Yeah, I mean, this is like, this is something that I think about a lot as a parent. Like the little wins are such confidence boosters you know like it doesn't have to be like the big thing that you're going for but like just a little win like i went and i did 10 minute workout you know it's like a little win like good fuck you world yeah i mean you it it, it makes a difference and it, i think you you said it like beautifully like it, it's a it's a confidence booster and i mean those things do 
sort of, I, I think they add up and make a big difference. For what sure. else haven't we said about exercise? Is there anything else lurking in there that people need to be aware of? Um, I think, you know, the big thing was was covered with respect to vigorous intensity, really focusing on on getting that vigorous intensity every week, focusing on the VO2 max training, knowing the brain benefits, and then any any kind of resistance training obviously is important. Those are the really, I think, big main things. What would be, if someone isn't going to go and get their lactate tested or do a VO2 max test with the mask on and all of this stuff, what is a rough benchmark that people can use to check i am making progress this awful norwegian four by four torture device is, that i've been doing every sunday for the last six months has helped like what right what, yeah. how can people do the like home version of the right. test yeah so obviously a lot of people use their um w apple watch which does measure vo2 max but I would say um, if you want an evidence-based way to measure VO2 max and um, the reason why the Apple Watch isn't necessarily accurate is uh, because – so so the, the thing that's really been shown to, to be a good way of estimating VO2 max is what's called the 12-minute run test or 12-minute walk test depending on your fitness level, right? But um, you need to have access to like a flat either track or something, some sort of – you know, thing that's 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 flat, right? You could also, I mean, no, it's got to be distance. So if you can somehow, yeah, clock that in on your your watch as well as you're on a bike. I think the best thing would be a, a track field or something like that. And um, what you do is you you in 12 minutes you run as fast as you can to ma and maintain that pace for 12 minutes. And then um, you have to have that distance measured, right? So that distance is measured, um, and then that there's this calculation that is done um considering you know the distance that you're whatever you've run and everything and that turns out your vo2 max and that's kind of what the apple watch uses but the apple watch doesn't know when you're like running hills and stuff hmm. so it's it's kind of because that, that takes it into account so if you're running hills and stuff it's more challenging you're not going to go as far yep. right um and so that's kind of where i go oh well the apple watch is only so good so i, I wonder whether I'd be interested to know if there's people who can uh, cheat this test in some way. Let's say that uh, one person builds their VO2 max. Uh, what I'm thinking with this Norwegian 4x4, I probably do need to start doing it. Airbike to me seems to be the best thing that I could think of. It's the easiest machine for me to get my heart rate very high on. It's both arms and legs. It's stationary. There's no picking it up, putting it down, resetting it. And it also means that during those three minutes, you can kind of just push away like this, but I would imagine that the person who does running intervals for their Norwegian 4x4 will develop a number of efficiencies that are uh, disproportionately advantageous for this 12-minute run test, right? My, oh, someone does it in the pool, right? Someone does swimming intervals, four minutes, three minutes, whatever, um, <clears throat> how much that will cross over. So there's definitely going to be ways like uh, high rocks, hybrid training, this whole thing at the moment is a huge, huge burgeoning. It's basically filled the hole that CrossFit used to have, I think. Um, and I think a lot of people are going to have that, but I wonder how many people have um, like disproportionately good 12-minute run tests that may actually overclock the VO2 max because of their efficiency that they've developed from using running as their modality for building that VO2 max. Right. No, I mean, it's a good point, I think, for sure. Um, most of the Norwegian 4x4 protocols are done on a stationary bike most of the time. That's the king. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Rhonda Patrick, ladies and gentlemen. Rhonda, it's been really great to meet you. I love your work. I love the fact that you've just got this broad evidence base that you can tap into and teach us mere mortals about what's going on in the world of fitness and such. You've got this bdnfprotocols.com thing, which is a free uh, guide that people can take in order to maximize different ways to get BDNF? What's what's in that? Um, it, it's a bunch of protocols that that have been uh, evidence-based that are, you know, how to increase BDNF, exercise protocols, sauna protocols, polyphenols. So we're talking about blueberries, things like that. And then I kind of have my protocol in there interweaved. It's like, like well, this is what I do. Uh, but yeah, so it's, uh, I think some people want to know, well, how much, you know, how hard do I go to get my BDNF from a run or a workout or what do I need to do? So there's, there's, it's like kind of evidence-based protocols on different things, different lifestyle factors and behaviors you can engage in to improve it. Oh yeah. Where else should people go? They want to keep up to date with your work. Uh, YouTube channel 
and it's called Found My Fitness. I have podcasts where I interview experts. Sometimes I do standalone videos where I talk about the science of something, um, diving into magnesium next. We, I also have one on vigorous exercise. And then I'm um, on podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, and then my website, foundmyfitness.com. That's where you can find me. Sign up for my newsletter, but I would go to the BDNF protocols to, to get all the, the good protocols on uh, improving brain health, basically. Hell yeah. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode with Rhonda, I have a conversation with Dr. Peter Atia, which you can watch right here. Go on. Tap it.